<laughs> what is going on, everyone? We are live. We are live. We are dual streaming this thing. Eric has that sweet hoodie on. Yeah, man. Uh, working class zero, man. Look, look, look what it says on the back. I don't know if you'll be able to see it in frame, but am I in frame? I can't tell. Yeah, Liberty yeah. and Giants. <laughs> yeah, there you yes. go, man. I had to My have buddy uh, Dirds has that sticker on the back of his truck, and, and that is so cool. Like that, I love that it, man. That brand is so cool. He really is. He's got he's got game, and he makes a great bait. I threw it last year in Florida. I missed every fish that bit it. Um, I, I just completely too quick with the with the set. I had a big fish at the bank t bone it. Uh, it was exciting, man. But uh, I'll have another chance this year. Headed back down to Florida to throw it. So we'll see in what February. Are you going? Okay. Um, the week of February fourth. So um, Harris Chain of Lakes, and then headwaters for four days. That'll be. Sweet, and I'm, I'm gonna keep a big bait in my hand and see what happens. That'll be sweet. Zero well, cool. or zero. <laughs> the way we're going to basically run through tonight, um, I'm going to do a little intro. We're going to talk about, you know, the bourbon or whatever, because it's Bass and Bourbon Podcast, and then we'll dive into the like, ADM baits. Um, so I'm just going to shoot a quick intro. Uh, Alex is going to munch on some pretzels, and yeah, <laughs> we'll get started here. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to Bass and Bourbon, episode number three with my I man. Love it. Mr. Alex Rudd and Epic Eric. Tonight we're going to be drinking some 1792. This is a small batch bourbon. Just really, really classic. Um, I think that's when Eric was born. <laughs> what? That's it. I'm sorry. You, you did, you based on the size of my collection, you think I've been collecting since the whatever it was, 1800s. Right. Oh, God. So, yeah, so that's what we're going to be drinking tonight. We're going to be hanging out talking <laughs> Japanese market baits. We're going to be talking. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. The impact of baits on the domestic market. And Eric's going to school us in some uh, kind of the history of the market, right? Because, like, you've been around and you're like a bait junkie, dude. Talk oh, to yeah. us about, like, how you got into that. Man, when did the when did the descent into the black hole of JDM baits happen to me? I started looking at some of my old emails because I was hunting for a bait and like I think it was 2010 and uh hunting for specific baits. And so, you know, for 12 years, a lot of nights on eBay forums. Um, but I'll say this, I'll hold up the bait because I want I want to hold it up. So, you know. The God hunting action in a crankbait supposedly is hunting action, right? Can it be built into a bait? A lot of bait makers claim they can. Some balsam makers have claimed that they can, and they're super expensive. Do they actually hunt? Because each piece of wood is different. Engineering it into a bait is really tough. So I think I Googled the search terms, and this video came up on YouTube. It was completely in Japanese, but I saw the bait, and I didn't know what the bait was. But I yes. figured it out, and it was the Imakatsu Waddle Bats. So the Waddle Bats. This there's two sizes. There's big. There's a little one too, but this is the size that I first bought. So if you guys could see it, I'm sure a lot of people know about this bait now. But it's got this triangular blade on the bottom, and you know what I found out about this bait when I bought it was that you can't overpower it. It's not a burning bait. And my first experience was with Bob Cherry on the Potomac River, one of the best crankbait guys I know. I've told this story before on stream, so forgive me if anybody's heard it. I'll tell it, I'm sure, five more times in the future. Just going to have to listen <laughs> through it. So we go, we're on the Potomac. We go to some shallow wood. It's post-spawn. The fish are on the wood, right? Some guarding fry. He's sewing his trusty minus one. Courtney, his daughter, gave it to him. It's 20 years old. Paint's been chewed off. He catches them on. I've seen him catch limits on it. He's getting every cast at the wood. I mean, he's a cranker, right? He's positioning the boat. He's 45 in the bank. He's cast to the V's, cast to the trunk, cast to the end. He's covering every, he's not leaving anything for me. I'm just chucking my waddle bats by. All of a sudden, three pounder comes out. <laughs> I think down that first stretch, five bass in the boat. And he's like, damn. And I'm like, holy <laughs> shit. And then they are throating it. So Is then this I like think the first time you threw it. First time on the water. Then I pick up the big bat to go down, back down, because I figured, let me change it up. Now, I've thrown a little paint on this bone one. It's got a little bit of uh, some of my little, you know, Sally Hansen. I just wanted a little flash and a little red throat, if you could see it, barely. And, um, man, like two snakeheads and maybe a couple more bass. So that's a lot of fish on maybe a 150 to 200-yard stretch of wood. They came out and ate it. And after that, I'm like, the Japanese have got game to think about how to engineer hunting action and then for it to work. And my next experience was a tournament with my buddy, Johnny Ingram, on the Upper Bay. 
I'm not going to tell you the cove. It's a very popular cove. A lot of boats in that cove, post-spawn, fry guarding. And literally, they were murdering this waddle bats. And I'm like, Johnny, you want one? He goes, yeah, man, give me one. And we both went to work. Um, I, a lot of fish. Nothing huge that day on the waddle bat, but the number of bites was stunning. And, you know, you can see who's catching what around you. And it's a it's a cove that had a lot of boats. So it That's just showed crazy. me the power of, was it the first time they saw the bait? Probably. Would they get a condition to it? Maybe, because I think bass do. And so from that day on, it, it, it really, those moments stuck in my mind. And I hunted down other bladed crankbaits from Nasheen. Uh, Battle Bats is another one, which is a deeper diver. Um, this one, and this is scored for me in tournaments. In, in really like community hole areas, they get the shit kicked out of them. I come through with a bait like this that they might not have seen in erratic action. And it triggers bites for me. So it's, so, you know, and the finishes are incredible too. So battle That's bat versus me. waddle bat. Like what's the difference between the two? Cause well, I have a battle bat. So they both have the same blade on the back. You can see this has a much longer bill. So this is probably a five, you know, I'm not dialed into the exact depth. Depends on what pound test you're throwing, but it's definitely reaching the five to six foot range for me. And this is maybe like a two to three foot range. So That's yeah. cool. Yeah. And then they have a diving waddle bat. This is the battle bat, thinner shad shape profile, depending upon what, what your forage is, but they, they, they all catch them. So yeah, man, that's what got me hooked. It was this bait that made me go deep. Yeah. <laughs> and then from there, like, what would you say is the most, I don't know necessarily most unique, but like the bait that you love the most from Japan, like is from there Japan, one that sticks out? Um, before the, the, um, before the jackhammer, it was this bait. Um, this is um, this is the Imakatsu Mogula Monster Moth oh Chatter. God, yeah, dude. And so hunting action, right, in my brain, right? So hunting action. So now I'm trying to find other baits that hunt. And this is a chatter bait that absolutely hunts. Now, this has a Zacco on it. It kills the hunting action a little bit. But um, you throw other trailers on it, and, and this thing can be too much hunting like you can't control it so i'm with pete Gluzik, the dean from the bass university with the, we're with a guy named randy from hat cam who's basically got a camera in his hat and he's pitching pete and they're working together on business ideas bass you hat cam all this stuff right so this is before gopro killed the hat cam so this is this tells you how early it was right <laughs> so i have an imakatsu mogula moth chatter pete has his regular chatterbait and his favorite color Pete's a guide and a pro, right? And so I'm the last guy in the boat. It's Pete, Randy, me. And I have my, you know, I'm throwing a red color and I had uh, a Sasu Techie Craw on the back. I remember it was a red and it had some flat rubber on the skirt. I thinned it out a little bit. I put the black and blue Sasu Techie. So I had a red and black and black and blue trailer. Odd color combination, but the water was a little dirty and it was a full moon. I felt like the craws might be sloughing. So I, we're in popular back channel area i'm catching bass catching bass in another area then we go really close to the cove i just talked about with the waddle bat and uh it was at carpenter's point and pete turns to me after i caught a few more and goes give me your rod now <laughs> <laughs> and i give him my rod and in 150 yards he caught two three and a half pounders in some scattered grass and we looked at each other and we said sometimes it is the bait and I said, watch this bait in the water. And I just pulled it by the boat. And this thing is going. I don't have to stab. that. It's the, it's the, and this is what gets me about JDM. It's the engineering thought that goes into how, and now of course, you know, there's a patent infringement, obviously for the domestic, you know, bait, but there, I guess they didn't have an international patent or couldn't enforce it. Don't know. Don't care. Cause I'm just a consumer buying a bait. Yeah. So don't, ha don't hate me. <laughs> so, so if you look at this, like the older mm -hmm. chatterbaits had, if the original, original apparently had the, the, this, this blade hook on the top of the head, see how far on top it is. Yeah. Look mm -hmm. at the configuration of the head too, the shape of it. And so I think it has to do with hydrodynamics mm -hmm. and That's for them so to cool. think about hydrodynamics in a chatterbait <laughs> to make it do that. So that it has action that that it's trying to flee or scatter if, if bass is tracking it or I'm not hitting a piece of cover or snapping it out of grass. And, um, you know, they also made a really effective in the hook. I loved it was a high carbon steel gaff hook. 
And so, you know, you just didn't miss fish. And Z-Man at that moment was changing their hooks. You got junky hooks on the market. I'm like, damn, man, you know, can't you give me a good hook and a bait? <laughs> and so, so they always, American manufacturers sometimes always find a way to maybe ruin a bait. And it's disappointing to me. Um, so this bait did a lot for me. It had an amazing hook. It had hunting action. Um, I didn't love a lot of the colors. Uh, so I would, you know, paint them with nail polish and change the skirts. But yeah. um, I've, I've turned some people on the streams onto this uh, bait and uh, they've had some of their best days, you know. And that thing is not like a legion of people, but anyway. That thing's silly. I mean, like, it's just like yeah. the, the, you're right about the hunting action on that one, dude. I mean, like, yep. it's one of those, when I first got it, like, I, I forgot, I put, I think it was a kamikaze swimmer on the back of it. And oh, like, wow. And so it was just like, I mean, dude, it was everywhere. And I'm like watching it come back to the boat and I'm like, am I reeling it too fast? Am I doing something <laughs> wrong with it? Yeah. And I cast it back out there and like the third cast with it, I catch like a three pounder on it. And I'm like, yeah. So that's it's like the deal. Like that's the deal about it. Is it is it just it? You're right. I mean, dude, it is mm -hmm. all over the place. It's up. It's down. It's left. Down. It's right. It's crazy. It's totally it, unpredictable. And I right. think that's one big thing. Like with the jackhammer specifically, that I find fascinating is that it's incredibly reliable. Yes. Like it does exactly what it's supposed to do every single time, the same exact way, which makes yep. it really good because you can get really dialed in on the bait, right? Yeah. Whereas like some of these other JDM bladed jigs aren't as I would say reliable in the fact that they do so many different things. Like True. they, you know what I mean? Like the, that is part of the hunting, the hunting action, right? Or right. getting trying to get a hunting action out of anything is it's, it's right. inconsistent, you know? You're and right. I think, and it, it's, it's fascinating to me. I think a lot of people look at JDM stuff and I'm sure we'll get in this conversation. Duo Realis is a great example of a company like that is you have to learn the specific bait and what 100%. it's specifically made to do. Whereas right. like a lot of American baits are just, they do the thing and they That's do right. it really well. You know what I mean? Where the JDM right. baits, it's like, here's this little bitty, like, mm -hmm. like nuance that we've created in this thing. Yep. And now yep. go take the time to learn how to use that nuance to catch fish. That's and I right. think that's that, what that's what drew me into JDM baits more than anything. It was just and being an East Tennessee angler, it was funny. I talked to Travis while he was, you know, we was down here and we were together. And like we got to talking about fishing, and he was like, Man, is it really just that tough down here? And I was like, Yes, dude. I was mm. like, you have to be so dialed. Like you have to be wow. dialed and then dialed a little bit more. And I think that's where my obsession with JDM baits came from. It was just like finding that hyper specific little thing. That mm -hmm. stood out from the rest of the stuff that would help me to just get one more bite or two more bites. That's, it's you almost like I mean? Japan. It's like I yeah. think the Japanese anglers, it's so competitive and so pressured that if they yeah. don't try to do something funky or a yep. bait that does something unique or a shape or a profile or a movement, that yeah. that's that's what drives them. And so, yeah. you know, like if you're square bill in a stump row. I don't want a bait that goes like, because like, I'm reeling past the stump, all of a sudden it goes a, a foot out to the side. What the hell? The, yeah. the bass is on the stump. So you want a crankbait yeah, yeah. that tracks true, right? Hit the stump. Hit the yeah. stump, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So right bait for the right right, right situation. So, yeah. Yeah, man. That is really Crazy. interesting, though, like talking about duo realis, because they have, I don't know how many lipless crankbaits. And they have like mm -hmm. the Apex and the G Fix and the sure. regular Vibe and the Apex Vibe 100. Like, but every single one, like the Nitro, they're all dialed into like, this is when Aaron Martins or this is when David Swenside would fish this lipless crankbait. And this is when we would fish this lipless crankbait. And I'm like, I know, man. And then it's just like, what? How do you afford <laughs> that? Right. That's yeah. the tough part. That's the tough part. I hear you on that, man. If you've got like situations for four different styles of traps, I I'd want, I'd even want to pull my eyeballs out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing when you know like okay this is the bait and like i know i yeah. can do it in this thing but like yeah man, man, it's just it's amazing man and, and the jdm market too like you said brings so much new insane engineering whether it's megabass True. or duo or imakatsu or whoever yeah. it is and it's just unbelievable so is it there is, a company man. in japan is there like a single company that you think is the furthest ahead right because like you have top and bottom companies here or or kind of how does that work over there? 
Man, um, wow, I've been all over the map from Nori's to Imakatsu to Dual Realis to, oh man, but probably Imakatsu, I'd have to say if I picked one, just because they gave me two of the baits that I still rely on today. Um, you know, their quarter ounce Imakatsu Mogula Monster Moth Chatter or even the Perfection one, um, don't put your chatter bait down in the summer, throw a quarter ounce, but throw it with a good hook. So right now, you know, the Chatterbait Mini Max, does that fill the hole? It's a smaller blade. Does it get the same bites as a bigger blade of Chatterbait? I don't know, but that's a void in the Jackhammer market, right? Uh, but they have made smaller tungsten versions. Uh, but I'd say Imakatsu. I got to say Imakatsu. Yep. I mean, but I own a lot of different brands. And there's some really niche brands that I started to follow, like Nasheen. Uh, was you know Hiroshi Nishin, Voice of the Water? I I loved his uh, foam baits. Uh, were original mm -hmm. his original baits. There you can't get those anymore. He's making them with injected plastic, but uh, that caught my attention early because he had a bladed crank bait, very unique bill shapes and designs and profiles, and had some pretty good success with cover cranking those. But um, yeah, I mean, um, if we could just keep going on the chatterbait one, I still I'll give another little ghost up. Um, yeah. the, the I don't know if anybody's heard of the hula chat, but for cover, you know, like chatterbaits through wood, they don't tend to mix unless you are a master at it. But this one will come through wood and literally you can cover crank it. Like, I mean, put it in the junk. Which one yeah. is that? It's <clears throat> it's the, it's the Nori's hula chat. OK. Yep. So hmm. what makes it? How does I, it come through? Don't throw so the long? don't throw the black and blue. If I I wouldn't throw that color, I, I just, it, do, it doesn't get bit. Trash. Um, it's, it's, trash. it's 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 the configuration of the blade and where it is. So yeah. the way it rides, if if this is a stump, the blade is doing this, and it hits the stump and just rides right over. It doesn't roll. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, for the way the bait's made. So yeah. So you have know, you seen that new tackle one? The tackle with like a weird. I have like, weird blade on it. I don't keep going, right? So once I find something in the chatterbait category, like I got my cover crank and chatterbait, I've got my grass chatterbait. I love jackhammers too, right? And I love some of the finesse chatterbaits out of Japan. Um, I'm square. It has to be super compelling for me to keep going because I'd be broke, man, right? I mean, they keep evading. <laughs> so it's got to be so fantastic, right? That it's got to supersede anything that I have in the arsenal. So I look yeah. at them all. I try. But there are baits I don't know about, man. Plenty of them. There's thousands of baits in Japan that I've never even heard of. I've been some. I, I mean, I, I one time I went on a Japanese site that I hadn't spent much time on. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> this is how much I don't know. And I'm like, I have to stop. That's Literally, what's just, crazy is, myself. is in Japan there are as many small little brands like as mm. there are jig builders in America. You know Isn't what I mean? Crazy. Like, and that's the crazy thing is like, right. you know, I would love to go to Japan. And that's a trip me and Ben have been talking about for oh like going gosh, to Japan right? and just like go to these tackle shops and walk around and just look at everything. Like, that, you know, that would be painful. I would I, I don't oh, know what yeah. I would do. I, I would oh. like hang it up like like I found that little gem, the shaky chatter. Who's ever heard of a shaky chatter jig and like an eighth ounce. Right. But I caught yeah. the big fish of the trip with Travis up in the St. Lawrence. I was with Will in the boat at Gajo Bates, yeah. and this produced a six plus for me, man. And I lost one on Ontario that was even bigger, and it blew huh. me away. I mean, yeah. man, and I was I was probably hypothermic at the time, so I'm just gonna call it that. <laughs> that that's why I lost the fish. But he took the last scream and run. But this little dude, man, it's a football hedge chatterbait, mm -hmm. and it's small. Dude, I would I would love to bring one of these up to you, Ben. Just go, let's That's try it. Crazy. Let's drag that along the bottom. Think about it. You've got, you know, the action of a chatterbait and a little morsel size. I wish the hook was stepped up a bit, but mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you know, can you go wrong with a green pumpkin? I have mean, you played jig. with those uh the queen tackle switchblades? I have some, but I haven't played with it. Um I, I bought either. some for a specific purpose. I've I've made a few um, you know, like there was a piranha um chatterbait. Uh, back in the day they stopped making it because they got they got rung up but they still sell the jig head with the blade so you just buy them and put it together yeah and that is a good slow rolling chatterbait right that's probably my favorite it has a thicker blade a harder thump and you can reel it a lot slower so you know that's in the chatterbait arsenal as well but that's domestic right so nothing to do yeah. with japanese products right there so there's yeah. there's great baits out there 
and the regular old chatterbait still catches the hell out of them. So, man. So this is one of the things I was thinking about, and this is where the name of the, the live stream came from. Our JDM bait still worth the money. When I originally got into bass fishing, which wasn't that long ago, like really hardcore into bass fishing 10 ish years ago, 10 to 12. Yep. Well, back then, even that like short of a time span, um, Lucky Craft was the deal. Like Lucky Craft was the oh, only bait yeah. you could really get your hands on over here in America. Sure. sure. And and those baits were like fourteen dollars, fifteen dollars, sixteen dollars a piece. Nineteen ninety nine. People, yeah, people were like losing their mind at how expensive these baits were. And now we're talking, you know, we're here and baits are twenty seven dollars for a jerk bait or whatever. So, right. Kind of what has that progression looked like in the bait world? I mean, in, in your world and in, in the bait world and um, kind of where do we start to see this going, right? Do we start to see American manufacturers take some of these technologies and bring them over here? Because I think we do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just really interested in like the impact this is going to have on these American companies and their innovations. <clears throat> that's a great question man that's a thought-provoking one i mean right lucky craft took a hit and now they're selling their american-made version of all their build baits like the crankbait models right for what 6.99 yeah is it is it the same bait that's a big debate uh, the only thing i know about the 1.5 right arguably one of the best 1.5s ever made and i'm sure other 1.5s have <laughs> come in the market like you know strike kings 1.5 right i mean ruds 1.5 they catch them right yeah. so would anybody still pay 1995 but somehow some way when you see it on ebay uh, a rick clun lc 1.5 still goes for good money so there's something about the lore they did change the ballast weight from tungsten to lead does that make a difference <clears throat> i don't know enough about the engineer of bait to tell you um are they as precisely manufactured? Did they change the plastic? What does that, it feels different in my hand. And it feels different when I reel it. Is the fish feeling something different? I don't know. I just don't know. But why was the bait 1999 to begin with? Are the paint schemes yeah. the same? They look the same. Is their ghost minnow the same today as it was then? It looks the same. That's a tough well, question, Well, you start to man. talk too, right? Like, the, the cost of engineering and the cost of what it takes to actually go into that bait. Cause they really had the first true suspending jerk bait. Sure. Right. And so like every guy's over here is throwing a Husky jerk and they're like, yeah, we get to try and get it to suspend or they're trying to do what they can do. And then you have the lucky craft come in and you're paying 15, 16, 18, 20 bucks for this bait. Mm -hmm. And now you have a jerk bait. You don't have to worry about it. You can throw it on bait right. here and it actually yep. sits in the water and sits, you know, suspends horizontally. And yeah, it's just really interesting. Like what is the cost of innovation and does it eventually get to the point where American companies can make it as effectively or, ja or excuse me, Chinese can knock it off. Right. And your generics, Sean Lai, who's huge shout out to him. He's in all of these. Um, he starts to talk about basically innovation is essentially open source, right? So essentially when things are built, that technology or that idea now is super easily available for a company to take it to China and, and basically rip off that, you know, innovation. Right. I mean, I think, hell, like an American, American can rip it off with a 3D printer. I think, I mean, yeah. like, that's the thing now is like innovations got to the point where like, I seen a thing the other day, it was a guy on TikTok, <laughs> which was hilarious. I was scrolling through TikTok. He like downloaded the schematics for a Vision 110 plus one and 3d printed it that's and so like, crazy and it was house. like so, yeah at, you know did it at his house and like i don't you know obviously the plastic's not the same or maybe it is i don't know the whole story behind right. it but he just did it for the tiktok and like literally it someone had taken a vision 110 cut it in half scanned it in to their computer with some kind of scanner that they had and he 3d printed this bait and so I think that's the deal. I think that's why, like, what drove a 1.5's price down. I think it's what's mm -hmm. going to drive a lot of these prices down is the fact that it's getting so easy to just copy something. And, like, right. the availability of things online. Like, if you see something that you want and, you know, mm. I say you can't get your hands on it, if you can build it, then you can probably go on Amazon, buy all the pieces and build it, and then have your own of that thing. And, it, right. and it's very, very easy now, and it's cheap. Like, 
um what was a great example of this uh when the um the tokyo rig came around you know and, and oh, yeah. obviously i've been watching you know videos about the punch shot and all that like coming out of japan for like three or four years like you sure. did watching dudes totally in japanese talking about it oh yeah. when it hit the american market i was like okay this is easy to make i went on amazon i bought like 500 little wires you know little spinnerbait yep. wires pre pre-twisted spinnerbait wires for two dollars and fifty cents and took some terminal tackle out of my box and built my own tokyo rig yep and i did it for two dollars and fifty cents and vmc selling them for however much they were selling them for i think that's what is going to drive down the price in innovation is the fact that everything is so easily accessible to everybody now mm -hmm. and like all it takes is one video getting out on the internet and everybody knows about something. And then Very people true. are just like, well, I'll just build that myself. You know what I mean? The, like, and, I, and that's what they do. I'd say the only challenge that the JDM, I think, market has over the person who's going to copy that Vision 110, well, then you got to get the foiled finish or the, the paint scheme right. That, yeah. And that yeah. is tough. And there's only a handful yeah. of painters in America that can remake some of the ghost finishes, some of the bluegill finishes, some of, and does that matter? I don't know, man, but I got to tell you, when people want their color, they want their color. Well, like, and you look I at got their some colors. Yeah. You look at their colors, man. And, and it's not they even just, dominate. you can knock off your, your solid baits, right? You can knock off like a solid color bait pretty easy, but it's these yeah. baits. Like I saw on the hookup the other day where the back of it was like gold mm -hmm. underneath somehow was like red. And so you yep. turn your, your jerk bait, like, Yep. It would look red from the underneath, but it, when it flashes side to side, you get the gold flash. Gold flash, right. Like, to really be that in-depth in your color schemes, like that's, I think, where, where you're starting to see um, companies, you know, be able to justify price. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's the finishes. Trying to mirror those finishes, you're right. And anything other than non-solid is, is a tough prospect, man, for the average person. Now you yeah, said it to yeah, a bait yeah. painter and maybe they could do it, but that's 10 bucks, so 12 bucks, 15 what, bucks. I don't know. What are they doing? Like, what's the, is that, is that the secret? I mean, is that the, like, how, how are they getting some of these finishes and some of these paint jobs? I mean, is it just, uh, that's trial where they and money, error man, they or is it, like, is it just trial and error? Or? And, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, know. like, so, when like I know Mega Bass, one thing I've seen them do before is they'll paint the inside of the bait and then paint yeah. the outside of the bait. That's right. And so and it's just like weird stuff like that. I mean, is that just like that, you know, that Japanese sense of of superiority when it comes to craftsmanship that they do stuff like that and that's what sets them apart? I mean, I, I'm not trying to degrade the I mean, obviously, like, dude, Mega Bass's paint jobs on some of their crap is just there's they're second to none. There's nothing yeah, out there that's like duo's the same way there's some stuff from duo that i look at and i'm just like dang gone like where you know what i mean but like <laughs> there has to be there has to be something in there that somebody can go oh hell i can do that <laughs> you know what right. i mean or like i just wonder uh, what that is like that fascinates it's, me it, to just... it's it's interesting i mean some of the paints used to be like automotive paints and you know the metallics i mean you got to do the research you have to understand color play and so yeah. there's all that that goes into it so i'm not a master color chief i play with sally hansen you know, and yeah. but I found some stuff that, you know, I'm like, mm, that's interesting. Walking around an art store, right. Finding some powders yeah. that I'm like, huh, that looks kind of neat. And they stick to <laughs> not only hard baits, but soft plastic. And then I go over with Sar Sally Hansen hard as nails. And I'm going, man, that looks pretty good. It's, you know, when <laughs> I do it this way, it's silver. And then when I move it that way, it's gold. It's called interference yeah. gold. It looks silver and gold, depending upon which way it's going. So it's crazy. Pretty man. cool stuff. Yeah, man. So, you know, sure. The little hairy homeowner like me can walk around an art store and go, would that stick to a bait? <laughs> and I've had some fails. Believe me. I've had, and I don't, I don't airbrush yeah. and I'm not going to airbrush. I'm down here in the bass lab. I'm not going to wear a suit. My wife would kick me out of the house. He's about to anyway with all this crap. <laughs> so no, I'm not taking it to the airbrush stage. Nope. I'm not doing it, <laughs> but nail polish. Yeah. Come on, come over and get your nails done. Come on, get your nails done. Uh, Eric's going to be spray. down in the basement with the spray gun. <laughs> yeah. Eric, what are you I'm, doing, man? Painting bait. I, I'm sure. I'm sure that's what's created some of my crazy purchases after I'm down in the lab paint with Sally Hansen. I'm feeling all right. And I walk right upstairs. eBay, what is that? I got to have it. <laughs> what is that? I need four of those. I, 
I don't remember uh, ordering that. That's the man. No, thing that's the really that's the secret uh, right there, dude. They're just getting high as a kite over there and just making stuff up. That's what they're doing. It's like it's like magical yeah. music out of the sixties, dude. Like it's you listen to Led right? Zeppelin. Yeah, that's you're like, right. man, how the hell did they come up with cashmere? And then you're like, oh, they were high as a kite. That's what they're doing in Japan. <laughs> that's right. It was pretty. It's like like right. I mean, those guys at Duo. I think it's Duo. Like they've got that big test tank. They've got the 3D printer. The mm-hmm. dude dreams it at night. Goes in, does his little 3D thing. Boom. And then it's on the test tank and Aaron Martin's, you know, watching it. God, God rest his soul. I mean, that was the yeah. coolest video. I'm like, oh my gosh, what? Yeah. Like they talked yeah. about it one day, printed it, waited it, painted it. And then you get to see it. And Aaron's like, do this tweak, do that tweak. That's well, like, amazing. We've had conversations with David on the channel before and his attention to detail is so next level. And I think that's what you get in these Japanese factories where it's not yeah. just, Hey, Let's you know put something together, and I know there's way more that goes that goes into this with Strike King and Berkeley and these sure. domestic companies, right? But like you put something together, you come up with a good design, and it's good. It's really good. But yeah. in Japan, it's perfect, man. It's mm-hmm. it's perfect. They build it with a purpose. They build it because there's a passion for the art of making a perfect bait. Very true. There's a there's a respect that's given to lure designers, and generally in Japan one lure company won't knock off another it would be mm-hmm. a, a shame they, they would feel shame so they're not going to go and steal that they're going to say i'm going to make something like it but better and different so that's they're mm-hmm. always raising that bar and i think that's what drives them as well and i think how tough the fishing is yes, and the mm-hmm. fact that a lure designer i'm sure like if you lived in japan you would know a lure designer's name and you know, Japanese bait companies, like you get on these members types of things and, you know, you, you have a little shrine in your corner and this is where you put your special baits that you get only from your members. It's just a whole nother level, man. It's a whole nother level. It's kind of like, maybe like the, what do you compare it to here, man? The balsa well, I mean, bait makers, you, like maybe, yeah. or the swim bait guys, that whole community. Yeah, I think it's the swim and, bait guys more than the anything. Swim you know, bait guys, you know, cult yeah. following. Yeah. Yeah. Because even the balsa guys, I mean, like, I'm, I am live in that culture down here. A you lot sure of our do. stuff is, oh, yeah. And a lot of our stuff is, though, is it's, I, I hate to say utilitarian, but it's very utilitarian. Like, but dude, we are, but catch there's the an shit art. shit out of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, man. I went <laughs> yeah. down the balsa hole. Yeah, 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 dude. And, but, it, I, but it's like mm. it's just a it's it is exactly what I described earlier. It is a well, I can't get my hands on it, so I'm gonna yep. make it myself. It is right just on. that it's that sense of like if I can't have it and I can't get it, well then I'll do sure. it myself. And sure. I think that just I mean that's just a sense of the type of culture it is in the South. I don't know about anywhere else, but I mean down Very here it's true. just like if I, if if we can't buy it, then we'll make it. Or we'll yeah. buy the pizzas to make it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, and it's just mm-hmm. very, I think that's what I mean by it being utilitarian is that yeah. it's just, it's the utility that we need. And so we make the utility that we need. And, and that's sure. what that whole balsa crankbait deal was. You know, it was just something we needed. And so we made it, <laughs> you know. That's very cool, man. Do you, do you know balsa bait makers down there? I mean, like, are there any of the older guys still living that you, you know, own their bait or followed them as, as you were growing up as a youngin? Yeah, that, see, my dad was the one that was like way deep into the balsa stuff, and he had mm. a lot of stuff, and he actually helped um, Stacy and Kelly from Mimic Lures get started. And sure. Mimic Lures is huge in Japan now, and and that's sure. what's funny is like balsa in Japan is enormous, oh. and that's their and, number and, one buyer is the Japanese, and they covet and so, American made baits. Now, isn't that weird? Yeah. Like yeah. we covet that this like the specialty lure thing that they got going on. Yep. But our good wood is yep. what they covet over there for sure. Exactly. Like Marty Burns exactly. and Rob Cochran, all their baits go yep. over there, man. Oh, for yeah. sure, man. Yeah. But yeah, man, I mean, it's it's fascinating. I mean, I don't know any of the guys personally. Um, I wish I did. That's, and I probably my box of mimic. Go. I got I got my mimic. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Maybe I got two boxes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, dude. Are I they probably still got making stuff. them? Are they still I, making yeah, them? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. But they yep. don't sell them here anymore, do they? Uh, no, it's all in Japan, I'm pretty sure. I think their entire market is in Japan. Isn't that yeah. like kind of akin to being a trader? <laughs> <You> got, <laughs> I can't get a mimic lure no more. Damn. Yeah. 
I mean, dude, this wow. is crazy. I mean, like that's the that's kind of the fascinating part about it too. And this, I I knew this would fi- come up in this conversation is the Japanese covet our stuff almost as much as we want theirs. Isn't and that it's the truth? Like, though that's so crazy, man. Think about that. Think so about like, what you just know, said. Why yeah. can't they? Okay, so they can't get a before they couldn't get a mimic lure. Why mm-hmm. with their craftsmanship wasn't somebody in Japan just going? Well, I'll make it myself. Do they have too much respect to go? I'm not going to rip off that guy's flat side. I'd rather him sell it to me and I'll buy it because I respect their design. Is that what's going on? Or it's an accessibility of materials. They because can't. one also thing, would. one uh, thing that I heard, I, I know, a I know a, a girl who went to Japan and she went to Japan for like three weeks. And she wow. said one of the most fascinating things that she noticed when she was in Japan was how bad they wanted to be American but they couldn't get their hands on a lot of American things. Wow. And I think it's the same way with like Japanese stuff. Like, I don't know, Pokemon cards, for example, you know, like sure. all these people want these Japanese Pokemon cards, but you can't <laughs> get them if, unless you're in Japan. And it's, so I think it's that <laughs> like weird. We, it's that greener. weird. Yeah, dude. Like we want the thing that we can't have, but she said, in like she great example. She said there would be like people in Japan walking around with shirts that said like, fuck you on it. And like they had no idea what it said, but it was American and it was American looking and it was American writing. So they wore it because it was American. Fascinating. Wow. Just like we buy things that are like, oh, that's cool. It's got Japanese writing on it. It must be cool. I think it's just they are reciprocating to us what we reciprocate to them. And I think to answer your question about the balsa, I think it's just a, a, a lack of the ability to get a hold of the materials to actually make the baits. Yeah. I think that's one big thing with them. And I think maybe now not so bad, but I don't know what the accessibility of, you know, like balsa and lays and like all the things Mm. that you need, the tools to build that. I mean, there may be some kind of inaccessibility to those things. Yeah, we can get them. He can go down to a hardware store and buy a lathe and then get you a big old piece of balsa wouldn't start carving crankbaits in Japan. You may not be able to do that as easily. I don't don't know. I I mean, you can get a whittling knife and go to work. I mean, right on your front porch. Yeah, exactly. And that's where a lot uh, of that came from. I mean, I mean like, think about it, right? I yeah. mean, that's how it all started. There was no duplicator. Yeah. There was no CNC yeah. machine, right? Yeah. I mean, in the yeah. beginning, there were probably relays, but I mean, none yeah. of that technology existed, I guess, until the 70s with Bagley and some yeah. guy figured out how to build a duplicator. That's pretty crazy, yeah. man. But there's still yeah, guys making handmade balsa today. But yeah. it's wild. Great yeah. point, man. They covet yeah. our balsa baits like we covet their plastic baits. That's just so nuts. Yes. Well, like, think it's crazy about it too. How does a company like Rappel make all those balsa baits, or how does That's Bagley? Nuts, man. How do they how do they make these baits so quickly? Duplicators. Right? Is that what it's it, called? Oh, it's a duplicator. I think so. Like big. Yeah. Like. <laughs> or, it's a, or it's a CNC <laughs> machine. I don't know, man. That's I don't crazy. know. There's some videos online. I, I don't know which they use. I always get them confused. Is it a CNC? Is it a duplicator? It's, it's not probably a, a CNC I, machine, I would guess. It's gotta I mean, be a CNC, right? Well, see, that's what my dad does for a living. Is he work? He works for a company that does CNC tools and and machines and different stuff. And I think that's how. I'm not sure exactly, but I think that's what he helped Stacy and Kelly with on Mimic was getting uh, them the the ability to do that, like to CNC base out of balsa versus lathing them each one by hand, because sure. you know. You can run those CNC machines down to ten thousandths of an inch, and so you can hold so tolerances that are insane, you know, yeah. in all kinds of different materials. So I'm sure in a piece of balsa, I mean, dude, you could probably hold it to tolerances that would blow your mind. And That's you just, nuts. you know, you lay out a slab of balsa on a big old CNC machine, and you top in a code, and that bad boy goes to work on it and just That's cuts just them all nuts. out. Yeah, Bodies. it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, they still got to get the weight in it, drill the hole, put the, you know, all the hardware yeah. in it. It's still a handmade process by and large, right? Yeah. That's Absolutely. the crazy part. And each piece of wood's different. That's yeah. the magic of balsa. Yeah. I tell you what was funny is I follow some, I follow a lot of Japanese guys on Instagram and it's hilarious. I can't read anything they post, but Me there's either. this one shop in Japan. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's in Okinawa is where it's at. It's and not it's Popeyes, skate... is it? No, oh, it's, skate it's, it's a it's a skate shop and a fishing shop in one. And so like these dudes have got like skating crap, like, you know, skateboards and stuff. And then they got fishing stuff and it's so badass. but like they got in some OG slims and like, I hit like Google translate on there to see what everything said. And like, they were so jacked up 
because they finally got OG Slims. And it was nice. just like, I was like, I was like, that's just the strangest thing to me. Like, <laughs> I would be so jacked up if my local shop got like, I you know, avocado, like a whole order of avocado stuff in. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, were yeah. So jacked because I got OG Slims. And I, this was what I just, I thought that's so funny. Like, this, you know, Ot Defoe, this dude from my neck of the woods, just, you know, Tennessee redneck, just like me, made something that some dude in Japan is so excited about because it's a rarity to him. Isn't that amazing? And I was like, it's like it's just it is such a fascinating cultural thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think all over the world you can go anywhere. You know, it's like the Russians in the eighties during the, you know, during all the you know the Cold <laughs> War and all that. They wanted blue jeans, like yes. blue jeans. They wanted yes. blue jeans, like blue jeans yes. was the thing. And right. like you don't you say that and you're like that's really strange, but it's American. It represents right. freedom. It represents yeah. you know bald eagles and national anthems, yeah. America. You know what I mean? And it's like America. I think yeah, America. And I think like the Japanese are us what we are to them. Like you look at samurai and like Japanese culture, and you're like, man, I would love to see that. Where they're like, mm -hmm. man, I want to see the Empire State Building and whatever else they think America is. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, right. It's just it's so cool, dude. It's so cool. So Ben, you were asking like, what's it mean for American companies? And I'm curious, like, what, in your guys' opinion, is the most innovative American manufacturer of bass tackle today? Who's leading that charge? That's come out with something unique and different that you just had to stand up and pay attention to. Like, oh, oh, well, hello. I think it's. I, I, think, it's, it. I think it's Maxent. I mm. really do think over the past couple of years has been Maxent in the invention of like these styles of soft plastics that mm -hmm. can you know disperse scent further than other you know traditional soft plastics <clears throat> hard bait i don't know like hard baits yeah. just seem to take you know these technologies from you know japanese or ex all these outside hard baits and just put them into different body styles but mm -hmm. like to truly come up with something totally different yeah you're looking at like max scent or maybe even z man Maybe like with their Elastec technology. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I mean, Berkeley, I think, I blew my mind when they came out with just the regular Berkeley power bait. I mean, I had like the day of yeah. my life on the Potomac, never came even close again to it. Like, I don't know if it was the scent or we just rolled up on a pile of fish. I was with Glenn Peacock, <laughs> who, who literally was a guide. It was my first, second trip on the Potomac. I wanted to learn it. I had my bass tracker, didn't want to wreck it. Lots of stuff you can run into out there. We're fishing close to Washington, D.C. Pull up behind this island called Hog Island, for all you people who want to know. It's still there. Um, and uh, We got one of those Hall, on Cherokee Lake. <laughs> that's so crazy. Hog Island. The, Hog Island. the odd we part was because, yeah, it was not yeah. for big bass. It was called for hogs that used to live on the island. Anyway. Same for ours. Same for that's ours. So Wild crazy. hogs lived on the island. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's so crazy. crazy. Yeah. And dude, we had a day. I mean, it was a career day for him. And he said, son. Turn to me and Glenn Peacock was a trip, man. His boat was a wreck. I mean, he was pulling out stubs of stogies to smoke from his glove box that were, I don't even know how old, but he lightened them up, man. It was funny, man. And he goes, I'm writing about this in the fishing report. So you better go to Kmart and buy all the all the Berkeley power bait you can. I'm like, you got it, Glenn. I mean, I had a bag of my own yeah, red shad. And, oh man, I it was yeah. unbelievable. Red yeah. shad, or what was that other one? Uh, tequila sunrise or something. Tequila sunrise, but the red shad in the seven inch power room is what I was throwing. And it was just unbelievable. He didn't even have any power baits. He just like, I'm writing about that. I'm like, damn, that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you know, it's crazy. I think I think Ben's right in the fact Berkeley is leading it on the science front. I think yes. that's what makes them so innovative is this, like, people don't realize, and I wish Berkeley, like, and I've told people over at Berkeley this, like, we need to do a better job of showing how much science actually goes into this. Like, mm -hmm. do they have biologists and like chemists and like, I mean, like all these people that are working on bass baits that don't normally work on bass baits. And like the science is immense that they're putting into these baits. Right. And I think that's a, a huge leading edge in the bass market. Now, like Ben said, as, I far, agree. As, like, as far as something like revolutionary, I mean, the last big true revolution in my mind was the Whopper Plopper. Like there, mm, yeah, yeah, nothing like that ever before. You know, True. you had Larry Dale Bird. True. I remember the videos of him going musky fishing with this thing that was that long, and then he went, oh, like, yeah, wolf fishing or whatever the thing, wolf fish down in the Amazon. With this thing it was this long, 
And then it's like he shows up with one, and it's like that long, and then another one's like that long, and another one's like that long, and then like that just took over for three or four years, and then just sure like did. everything, it had its peak, and now it's starting to, to to wane back off. But in my mind, that was the last like thing that stopped me in my tracks. Was like, oh dang, the, the whopper, whopper popper. Sure. You so, question I mean? for you: It peaks, and then you say it wanes. Here's the question. Do bass get conditioned to that sound and that action of that bait? And so you have to innovate and show them something different. Exactly. Exactly. And then it goes I, away. Know, Does it come back? Does everybody stop throwing the whopper plopper and all of a sudden they start biting it again? Did they ever stop I, biting a buzz bait? I think what you're going to see is uh, here around here anyway, for me, this is an anecdotal experience of mine. The spinner bait is making a comeback. Everybody had a chatterbait. Everybody's thrown, and it's like nobody throws a spinnerbait. Now, there's these few like old hats that are like, I've been throwing a spinnerbait since 83 and never put it down. Well, yeah, you have, but the mass majority of people have it. They sure. picked up a chatterbait sure. instead. And so I'm starting sure. to see that spinnerbait making that rise back up again as a bait to get bit on. But yes, I do think they get conditioned to it. We actually had a conversation with a biologist on my podcast about this. And he was talking about how they've done studies. And I've also talked to other people like private conversations where they've done studies that they can condition a bass to the point that it passes down in its genetics. The, what? the, the, inclination to stay away from something like holy crap so like you can you can you can alter a bass on a genetic level by showing it something so many times and i think that's what you're starting to see on a lake chickamauga is that you're starting to see generation upon generation upon generation of bass wow got stuck enough that they're done with it and like that's why it's hard to go down there and do what you used to do like 10 years ago in Chickamauga, which is go catch 40 and 50 pound bags of fish on artificial lures. Now you can't do it as easily unless you're in just one of those critical points in a bass's life where you can trick them. Sure. And, and I think more than anything as bass anglers, you know, that's what we're doing is we're tricking a fish. We're making a fish make a mm -hmm. mistake. That's, that's right. all we're doing. And I think it's just like killing a giant deer. You don't kill giant deer because you know, every, I mean, like you can have the best camo, you have the best gun, you have the best ammunition, you have the best scent blocker. You got that deer has to mess up though. That big yeah. giant deer has to mess up for you to kill him. And I think bass are the same way. And, and I, it's crazy, man. I mean, like I, the more and more I study and look at bass and the more I have conversations with people who are a hell of a lot smarter than I am about the actual science behind a bass the more I start to realize the effect that we actually have on them. And I mean, if we're affecting bass at a genetic level and they can pass down in their genes, the inclination to stay away from certain things, I think we're going to have to innovate and innovate and continue to innovate beyond anything you can imagine. And I think that's where science, I think you got to put as much science into the studying of bass as we are the development of baits to really bring it home, mm -hmm. putting fish into the boat and continuing to trick them. Right on. I mean, Max Scent was a revelation for a lot of people. That's the craziest yeah. thing I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah. I, I do mean, Bass Fishing I HQ, uh, Ty Berger's in here, and he said aggression and vulnerability is um, scientifically proven to be hereditary, which is crazy, right? Because I think that's why uh, breeding big fish, that's like the share longer program. Oh, um, yeah. Those are, you know, fish that share these traits of, you know, naturally uh, they're naturally able to get big right but they do that because they're able to eat and they're able to be a dominant species right like that goes yep. something talks about the aggression right yeah and like that's being passed down through generation and generation of fish and like kind of going back to what alex said right <clears throat> talking about the vulnerability issue like these fish are going to get smart and they're going to be you know i think they're just going to continually get smarter and so you're going to see ebbs and flows of why baits become successful and maybe not as successful and then come back later as being like another really popular bait. Yep. So. Yeah. Interesting, man. Well, you know, I Brandon, this Brandon, Brandon makes a good point. Bring up his comment for me, Ben, if you can see it. Yeah. He says, is, is it what I said, or is it the fact that Chickamauga has been pressured because of big bags cut over the years? Well, it's exactly what we're saying. It's that pressure. It's that, it's that being stuck in the mouth five times in a bass's life. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a coyote, I, I'm, I'm referring to different types of animals here, but it all, 
you really start looking at animals, they're pretty simple. You know what I mean? Like all animals kind of, they operate on the same operating system. And like a coyote, if you shoot at a coyote, a coyote will never again walk in the spot where it was shot at. Wow. It will remember it forever. Like any time that it has any kind of bad side effect to anything in its life, it will never do that thing again. And I think that you can get from the Madouba. Oh my God. My, my mama says that did an alligator so mean because he got all them teeth in his mouth and no toothbrush to brush them with. Um, but um, <laughs> I think I think what you see is that a, a bass a bass can only get stuck <laughs> so many times before he isn't gonna fall for something anymore. Yeah. And so I, I think that's what we're seeing is we're seeing bass that have been stuck so many times that they're not gonna fall for something anymore, and then they pass that genetically down to their offspring but then you also got those dumbass bass who you yeah. catch a thousand times like i've caught the same bass two or three times in a row and I've, i don't know i bought the same lure three two or three times in a row and i didn't remember it <laughs> I, exactly i mean there you go you know and i think I, I think that's where you get to aggress more aggressive bass right that's an aggressive bass versus a, a wary bass i mean all yeah. you know, animals are animals they still have brains they still have instincts and sure. I think just like us as human beings, you know, our life is a sum of our experiences. Well, a bass is the same way. It's life and, and it's intelligence, quote unquote. It's instinctual drive is a sum of its experiences. And if mm. it's experience being stuck in the mouth and brought out into a world where it can't see and breathe, when it hits something that sounds like something, I don't know how much memory a bass actually has, but there may be some kind of genetic instinctual encoding in its brain that goes, we're never, ever, ever going to take a chance to hit anything that sounds like that again. Because they tested that. They've done studies like that. You're right. You're on yeah. point, man. They've yeah. done studies. I think they did it with like three ponds and three different populations of bass. And they, and the Berkeley scientists, I mean, you're yeah. onto something here. They don't yeah. publish it a lot. Um, I, I remember reading it, but they've got, you know, it's a tank environment. So that's maybe not like a natural environment, but still, I think the mm -hmm. science holds in a lot of ways. But mm -hmm. it was fascinating to hear about conditioning to the same bait yeah the conditioning to the same bait shape and profile yep. it's like yeah you're on a ledge i don't fish mm -hmm. a lot of ledges but i'll give you mm -hmm. the uh parallel for me so i'm on a, a a deep summertime bite deep for me on my river is 10 to 12 feet maybe 14 mm -hmm. and i happen to mm -hmm. be fishing it on the potomac in 10 to 14 feet and i'm throwing my favorite berkeley power worm and mm -hmm. I'm catching my fish. And I mean, this is in a very specific area with very specific structure. I know the fish are there. I have no, this is, I'm going back years. I have no line of sight other than my weight on my Texas rig worm to feel the cover. And I know mm -hmm. when I've contacted it and I'm catching fish in predictable spots. There's some corners, there's some rubble that's here. And, you know, thinking back to like some of the bass articles I read change the color and profile. And so at our next pass, there's, there's two places that we fished. One's better than the other. So I picked off several here with my partner. And then we went to the next area where that a very specific area, very, we're literally fishing spots and picked off one came back, changed up shape and profile. And it's like, we got another round of them. I, because mm -hmm. we had tried with the same worm, didn't work. Mm -hmm. It took a it took a change in shape and profile, and so I fooled bass on that same area. And I'm talking like a 25 yard stretch with a rock, and mm -hmm. sometimes I'd have to use brass and glass with a four inch high float worm. Sometimes it'd be a seven inch profile. Might throw a crawl down there, but we could continue to fool them throughout the day in their bite windows if we changed the shape and profile. It was that simple. Um, yeah. And I, I, for, I think I've forgotten a lot of that stuff that I used to do um, mm -hmm. like that. How many people stay in the same spot? Now it's punch and move. Go look for the active bass because you've got live scope. You can see the fish. I'm not going to fish yeah. that, Doc, and I'll move to the next, right? How long mm -hmm. will it take? Here's a great question. If they can be conditioned to the sound of that sonar pinging them. They already you are. Guys, yeah, they, they are. Yeah. For real, they you see are. that yeah. happening. Do yeah. you have to shine them? Like... Like I've seen guys do this trick, like, you know, you're rolling around, you shine the area where you think they are, and then you turn it away. Yes. So you're not like sending so, out that pulse. I'm and then Clair, you're making your cast with a casting ring. Yeah. So St. Clair has this issue terrible right now. Really? And I think it's because the water's so clean combined with just wow. the, 
thousands and thousands of boats that are on it every single day. It's wow. Like, uh, Dirds kicked our butt this spring out of my buddy's boat who had live scope. They would essentially, they'd scope these fish, turn the scope off of those fish. Yep. And then cast to them. And yep. they just, you know, fish it through there and catch the fish. Right. But like, all I noticed all day was if I'd see one on live scope and I would scope it, I could not, it was so much more difficult to get that fish to bite. Whether it So was you, you continued to, you, you would, continued to shoot your scope at them, yes. looking at them to see how they might react to your bait yep. versus them going shining, making a cast. And, and it also matters like how far would. away, from that, how far away from the, the transducer they are. So what, like, what, wow, they would follow the bait. And then eventually get closer, close enough to the transducer and turn off almost at like the same distance all the time. What so was that it, distance? Just it was like 30 feet. It was like 30 what? feet. So whether or not they could see me, I don't know. But I know for certain that I wasn't catching fish because I was leaving that scope on them. I'm convinced if I had turned that away from them, yeah. I would have caught so many more fish. Because end of the day, we were like, man, it was insanely tough. Like those fish I could see, I couldn't get them to go. And he's like, yeah, you had to turn it away from them. It's you know, interesting, I, man. They got so many fish. I wow. I had a conversation yesterday with my buddy Michael while I was fishing with him, and we were talking about clear water specifically. But I think this can apply both ways. And then I want to answer Sobe's question because I saw somebody else's comment over here, and I think both of them play great in together. But I was telling him, like in clear water, you know, when it's clear like it is, I mean, obviously not clear like St. Clair or like Lake Michigan. I mean, but, you know, 10, 15 foot visibility. I was sitting in 15 foot of water, could see the bottom yesterday. Wow. And like, like I told Michael, I was like, you got to think, dude, a bass's entire instinct is if anything is over its head that mm -hmm. isn't a hard piece of structure, that's, that's death. <laughs> Dang, because, right. The, yeah. It's, Bert. it's death. Yeah, Bird it's, it's right. eagles. Yeah, it's sure. eagles. It's ospreys. It's cranes. I mean, like they come out of the egg scared to death of anything from above. Well, True. then if you think of a live scope, it, it has to be putting off some kind of electronic signature into the into the water that they can pick up with their lateral line or something, right? Yeah, They're picking hell up yeah. with something. Well, once they get to a certain size, the only thing then that can kill them is something in the water with them. And, mm. and like, so if you got fish that live in a lake that have bigger predatory fish and fish that can kill them, then that sound of that live scope may not, they're not going, oh, it's live scope, but it may be just enough disturbance in the water or just enough in a sh shift of electronic signature or whatever you want to call it, that those bass are going, hmm. That doesn't feel like good. Right. Yeah, their instincts are like, man, that's big and I don't like that. Like, what is yeah. that and can it kill me? Because like yeah. a bass, you know, is a really simple creature in the fact that it, it wants to eat, it wants to make babies, and it, and it wants to, you know, avoid being killed. Yeah. And, like, literally its brain is is wired to do those three things only. And mm -hmm. so, like, if a third of their brain is don't be killed, then you can't tell me that, like, them hearing live scope or whatever they're doing isn't going, yeah. that could kill me. <laughs> like, that's just instinct, kill. Like, it's going to kill me or I can kill it. There, there's no in-between. So interesting. Fascinating. Yeah. No, that is fascinating. That brings me to a whole nother point. It's like when I first threw a big bait, I laughed when I threw my gang craft jointed claw 230 slow sinking that Austin Neary from Dreamcatchers Fishing gave me at Smith Mountain Lake. We're on a big bass tour. He showed up with five rods, just like he said he would all be baits. I showed up with my shaky jig worm and all sorts of stuff. I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a catch him, right? And so I did. I caught a bunch of fish in practice. And he's like, when are you going to put that stuff down, man? I'm like, when you give me one of them gang crabs? And so he caught a good fish in practice. He gave me one. And I hit yeah. it on the side and I cracked it and I bought it. Uh, but, you know, I fixed it. And I I did catch a five and change on a whopper plopper the first day. One of the bigger ones, the, the 130. Not the 130. One, yeah, the 130. And so we weighed that in for $300, but about an hour later, he got about a six and change, which is a thousand dollar fish. We thought we won the boat. We didn't, but it was crazy to me. I said, there's just no way these fish are going to respond to something. that sounds like a brick falling off a dock right next to the float. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. watch. And I mean, I saw some of the biggest bass of my life, two and three at a time. Sometimes track didn't eat. And I'm like, this is a maddening situation. Out of 30 fish found that goddamn bait, how many go to bite? He goes, maybe three. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. But mm -hmm. it showed you where they lived. It didn't mean you'd catch them. But you're right. They're tuned into it. I don't know if that splash scared them at first. 
but then they had to come investigate it when they see a shape of a big shad or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And so what's really fascinating to me is a, a bait like the clash is so odd and so injured and so weird compared to your normal traditional glide. It's really kind of, it's, it's interesting to me that they bite it the way that they do. It doesn't look natural. And it's, well, it's like a, it's so big. It's all man. it's, it's, it's all so wonky. Even the even the class well, junior man. It's just it's nuts. not only is it big, Ben, but I always refer back to a lion stalking a herd of buffalo. They ain't gonna attack the big bad one. They're gonna attack the Very weird funky true. one in the back. They're gonna attack the one with the limp. They're gonna attack the one with something wrong with it. You know what I mean? And I yeah. think with big baits, I think it does two things. And, and I heard Chris Aldane say this the first time. Usually things in a fish's environment that is that big is not fake. So mm. there's almost a threat level taken away because it's, it's it's usually when a bass interacts with something that big, it's in its environment with it and it's not very fake. true. And he knows the gizzard that, shad can't eat him, <laughs> right? Exactly. He knows the gizzard right. shad's a meal. He knows exactly. the bluegill might spine him in the throat, but he ain't going to hurt him, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right? And so and I think the second thing that it does, and I've seen bass do this, and, and this was something taught me so much about fish. I got on a bite one time where I saw fish cruising, and I was throwing a fluke okay. to him and throwing a whopper plopper to him and getting him to eat it. Oh, wow. Well, I would throw that whopper plopper in there, and he would hit the water, and the bass would dart out away from it, like out of fear. And then when it realized in almost a split second, Oh, I can kill that. It was oh, like, man. it was like a drive got clicked over in them. Like, okay, it like, you, it, it's almost like it pissed them off. They were like, Oh, like I'm going to kill me. this thing now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, dude, and then they would just throttle its ass. Like dude, it, yeah. it was such a cool bite, but that was yeah. something I would notice. I mean, like they would so fast, almost in a blink of an eye, shoot five feet away from it but as as fast as they shot away from it it's like their brain registered they could kill it and they would shoot wow. the other five foot back and they would attack my fluke or attack my wobble that's pretty cool or, or whatever and it was it's so big too it creates a lot of commotion right and i've seen this on yeah. smallmouth lakes in deep water it creates such a commotion there's so much I, I, cliche drawing power to that bait that those fish can close on it so much more quickly and with such accuracy because they're mm. not targeting a bait that's four inches long. They're targeting oh, a bait that's yeah. eight inches long. Mm -hmm. And now they can more accurately target that thing and come up and, and either hit it or not hit it, right? And most of the times they don't. So <laughs> interesting, man. So, Burke, go, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Go, no, no, go, ahead, go ahead. Eric. Go ahead. No, no go ahead. I'm just I'm just trying to I'm circling back to Berkeley. Berkeley with the science of scent. And certainly has that translated into their crankbait game or their hardbait game, they have Jeez. dominated scent. I, all right. Great question. Yeah. That's got my attention. Power yeah. bait skirt. Is and it, some other stuff that's coming out we can't talk about. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So they've got the – like literally, Berkeley globally, the science of scent. I mean, we've all yeah. had experiences with power bait or max scent. If you have it, you've been missing out. And yeah. and I think their plastics were, are just money. I haven't loved their hard baits over the years. Uh, that's not to say that this new generation of hard bait, like a lot of people talk about the Stunna. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. How much it's, is the, it's how much is the right? Stunna? How much is the Stunna? Uh, fourteen dollars, I think. I think it's thirteen so ninety nine or twelve ninety nine. So, so that that's time out. I'm gonna take a time out right now. When's the last American made bait company that has released a bait above ten? 99 right that that is in the 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 slender hard bait minnow slash bait category can right. you think of long one time. long time i have i i've i've never seen one have you no. i can't I remember what six senses i mean it's it's probably the the most expensive right it's got to be yeah probably so tell me Probably. about the bait. I I, ha I threw it down south a little bit. I tried a new uh, Yozuri one. And, of course, you know, the, the, the tried and trues that have always been in my box. Right? Yeah. Mega bass. I'll, I mean, I yeah. personally love it. I'm a jerkbait fiend, and I love it. Um, okay. Let's what I like about, about it, what I like about it is the shimmy. It's that secondary action that it has. Like, Ooh. if I hit it soft, it, it'll it'll jerk out. It's not like super dramatic. Just hitting it kind of soft, it'll jerk out, and then it shimmies, and then starts to sink. And like even when you hit it really hard, like 
like on a soft jerk, it kind of rolls up, down, and shimmies. On a really hard jerk, it just pops out to the side hard, and then it kind of goes and then has that secondary shimmy and then starts sinking. And in really cold water, like what I'm dealing with right now, like sub 45, it sinks actually <clears throat> quite a bit faster. Um, but man, I'm telling sinking, you, I, sinking faster. So was it designed as a sinking jerk bait? Yes. Yeah. It was designed so, to be a sinking jerk bait. A slow sink jerk bait. Yeah. Right? Slow sink. Yeah. Yeah. And, and was the engineering question on the shimmy was because I'm a big, big, big fan of, of secondary action. Like if mm -hmm. I can find a balsa bait that when I hit cover, and I make that quick pause and it will back out and shimmy on the rise and sometimes make a turn towards mm -hmm. that fish. If I give it a little pop and that thing will do like a, a 180. Oh, devastating results. So was the shimmy engineered into the bait? I don't know if it was intentional, but it definitely they talk about it. Yeah. If it That's wasn't, it's if, it wasn't if it wasn't intentional, it's it's a great accident because I think that's yeah. the difference between a 110 plus one. Uh, Mega Bass and the 112 plus one, you know, Berkeley, because Dirds was throwing a 110 plus one, I think, or someone was throwing a 110 plus one in the boat, and I was throwing the 112, and it wasn't even close. Wow. Right? But the 110 is so crisp. It's so crisp, yeah. and when it stops, it stops. Right? Yep. But the the Berkeley bait has a ton of app, like movement and wow. Almost, almost sloppy. It's almost sloppy in a good way. Loose. It's like yeah. George Thurgood playing guitar. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, Mervin, it's not, boy, yeah. It's got... <laughs> yeah, it ain't Steve Vai, like the Vision 110 yeah. is Steve Vai, you know what I mean? Yeah, and like, baby. you know, the 112 is, is, uh, dude, it's weird, it is being it's sloppy, that's the best way to describe it. Like, yeah, where but is that is that injured? Is that like a weakness thing that the fish is per, you know perceiving? Man, Probably. because that's pretty brilliant. I mean, anytime a bait yeah. maker can but it can engineer. And if I was yeah. the person that developed the stunner, I'm like, oh yes, I meant to do that. Yes, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not telling. Not telling you how we did it, but I'm. I'm yeah. telling you that we built it right into that bait for sure. Well, I'll tell you the first the time we noticed it was the day we got we got a couple to go up and play with in the yeah. super clear water, and I. I like to put my phone to the test and sh stuck it underwater and was filming oh, wow. it. Well, I pull it on and show showing Alex, and we're like, man, it looks kind of nasty. Like it looks like sloppy, yeah. sloppy. Like it it yeah. shakes and it like has a shimmy when it's just sitting there, and it doesn't. Honestly, so it's sinking, man, it's, it's sinking and doing this a little bit. It's yeah. like it's yeah. like this yeah. this this dude. It is down. like. It is literally like your hand, like you know, like you oh know, my you gosh, can't like, make yeah. a jerk bait. So like when like when I say it goes up and like it's like what? like that, yeah. And it's wow. like this. I'm gonna it's pull. Hard, I'm gonna find the video so I can kind of show it on here real quick because I have the video on my phone. But it well, is well, hell, best man, way I'm excited. Describe. I'm excited yeah. that an American-made bait <laughs> company might have just developed a jerk bait that can compete with a JDM product. I'm proud. So here we I'm go. Very here we go. To see what happens here. Hold on, let me make you big. Let me make you big. Hold on, Alex. Oh, oh, hold on, Alex. I'm just playing it. I can back it up. Back it up. There you go. Okay. okay. Let me see. So, I think this is the good one. Maybe this other video. Oh, let me back. Let me do this other video. Yeah, it's this other video. is a better one. So you guys can see here. You can see that secondary shimmy, like when you when you stop it. And it's just very up and over, and it rolls oh, yeah. up and over, and it I shimmies. Saw, I saw, I saw the roll up and over. I saw that. Yeah, that was wild. I'm trying to find the slow mo. We got a slow mo video of it too that really shows it. Oh, let me see if this is it. Right here, it is. Here's the slow mo video that really shows it. Watch this. There you go. Look at that shimmy oh, wow. back and forth, yeah. back and forth. Hit it, rolls up over. Look, it almost turns. What? Up Elma turned over. What? Yeah. Shimmies. Oh, oh wow, rolled. look at that. Yep. Look at it. Rolls up and then shimmies. It's, look at that shimmy. And some of that's wow. probably because we're running a trolling motor and just like boat doing it next to the boat, right? Where it turns around like that. But it definitely like you can see it shimmy. Yeah. So it's different. It's different. It's cool. I mean, it's 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 awesome. Like it's it's and it's completely different than 
than I've seen yet. You know what I mean? And I think that's why yeah. I like it so much. I mean, because I love throwing a jerk bait. And I think this year when that jerk bait bite really pops off, just something a little bit different than what everybody else is throwing is going to be something that gets that bite. You know what I mean? Wow. How, how are the finishes like in the, if you compared the finishes? Now, look, man, I mean, they're just straight up solid color jerk baits that just, yeah, they're you just know, rip they're them. Just good colors. Yeah. Right? This is good. Yeah. Like they're just yeah. good colors. Um, I would argue they're better than most of the Berkeley crankbait. You're like, okay. argue they're better than most of the Berkeley colors because yep. some of the Berkeley yeah. colors aren't great, right? Right. So let's just be straight, but they're just good colors. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. You know, and something, I wanted to circle back to this on the scent thing, because this is one thing that validates the whole scent thing for me. This was totally unprovoked in a conversation I had with John, the biologist, on my podcast. I said, the question I posed to him, and, and you got to imagine, dude, this guy does not bass fish. He is not a dude who is knows really anything about the industry or science about the, you know, that is going into bait work. I said, John, what do you think is the most prominent sense that a bass has? He goes, well, by studies we've done, we're showing that scent is probably the most prominent sense that they have and the most important. He said, and we've even shown that bass can tell the caloric intake of a, of a prey item by the way that it smells. Is that why and they I chase said, damn blue back herring so badly? Because it's so, I mean, right? They know. Yeah. And like that was like, I literally, I was like, dude, you're going to have to time out and back up a little bit. Like him saying that, I was like, what? What? Like, so there's science showing that bass can smell the caloric value (laughs) of a prey item. So that's crazy, man. I mean, like, obviously, you know, with hard baits and stuff, it's a total reaction. But when you're talking about plastics, dude, if it smells like something that is worth them to eat, they're going to eat it. And wow. I think that that's a uh, that's huge, man. That's that's uh, just crazy. I mean, that's one of those things that make you really pause as a bass fisherman and go, "Huh, You're damn right." Like that's interesting. You know what I mean? Like, interesting, uh, man. That is very interesting. interesting. I know. So, I like when I open that bag of Berkeley, you know, Max or, <laughs> or Berkeley dude, Power feet, Bait. It smells like victory. <laughs> feet and protein powder is Max scent. Dude, feet and protein powder. It's Next time truth. you open a bag, smell it. It's feet and protein powder every time. All right, let's talk about another Berkeley bait that I don't know how it runs, but I'm super excited that an American-made bait company got it right. I mean, the chick magnet, is it going to work? I don't know. How's this going to compare to the OG Slim? Because they're like bumping up against each other. There is, I mean, I'm a flat side a freak. I love yeah. throwing a flat-sided balsa crankbait. I've yeah. caught some gems on those. Uh, they produce for me every year. Fall side, flat side, and early spring flat side. Man, it can be yeah. deadly. Talk to me about yeah. the chick magnet, man. This came, I miss it. East Tennessee so guy design, right? So that's Strike King. That's Strike no, King. No, I'm sorry. Strike King. Sorry about it, but I yeah, am, yeah, I am yeah. proud of them. That's what yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. So, like, I think Strike King and then obviously Berkeley with their Fritz side, right? I think yeah. what that does, I think a plastic flat sided crankbait with all the attributes of a balsa f- flat sided crankbait, I think what it does is it allows, like, I feel a lot more comfortable breaking off and beating the hell out of a Fritz side. And I get just as many bites on a Fritz side as I do some of my balsa crankbaits. And I think what it does is it gives accessibility to that bait sure. to people. It's a more affordable price point. And sure. it's just one of those, it's a lot tougher. You know what I mean? Yeah. And is I a do chick for, magnet, is that, is that actually balsa or is it plastic? ABS? No, it's plastic. It's a plastic. It's plastic. Yeah. And so it's interesting. I mean, like for me, dude, the Fritz side, <laughs> it's, so much better than you think it is. Like people, like I think they I like haven't, kind I haven't, of, haven't, haven't, haven't done as well. Me, I, I caught Alex a fish me, like, on Fritz my first side. cast with the Fritz side, and then that was the beginning yeah. and the end of my success with it. Probably because I took it off and didn't throw it anymore. Yeah. But it, it was only like a twelve inch fish. First cast. That was probably the death yeah. of the bait for me. You know how what they say in the tournament. First cast, and it wasn't a derby too, man. Like he yeah. t- he texted me the other day. He goes, "Man, the Fritz side's so much better than I thought it was going to be." Or, um, All right, let's yeah, talk about the Fritz side. For. I want to talk so, about what Fritz side are you throwing and what one have you had? the Okay. All right. Look, if I only limited you to one Fritz side depth range, which one would you pick and why the, and when? 
the big one. It's the what size is that, Ben? The five it's big the, the big the five big one, and it's, it's the a big two one. to six. Yeah, it's the two to six foot diver. That's a man. That's let me tell one. you something. If you right. put some Berkeley, I upgraded the hooks on it to Berkeley Fusion EWG number sure. four sizes. Yep. When I did that, it turned it from a slow float to a suspending crankbait. Oh, you hit the money and, right there, man. And sub 45 degree water temperatures. Oh, yeah. You take that thing and any substantial piece of cover that you hit, when you hit it and pause it, that bait deflects off. It rolls up and it centers. It does not shimmy. It literally mm -hmm. rots itself and stops. And dude, I've had so many fish eat that thing on that roll, hit something, stop, and then as soon as you go to turn the handle again, he's they there. Smack it. He's there. Yep. And dude, that yep. crankbait from the beginning of fall, from kayak river fishing and current to Highland Reservoirs to Chickamauga and everything else been in between, dude, that thing is killer for me. Yeah. And it is really fascinating. Like, that's why I told Ben, I was like, dude, it's so much better than I thought it was. Because yesterday I went to one of the most pressured lakes that we have around here, high bluebird skies, post front, super tough conditions, and cranked the Fritz side the little bit deeper diving one upgraded those treble hooks a little bit upsized them a little bit to get that suspending action out of it same deal man cranking that thing down a 45 degree angle bank i'd hit a rock i'd stop it i'd go to roll it again they pound it and right on man, man it's interesting i'm super fascinated by it i'm, I'm right. honestly just surprised Top colors, top color. Why are you surprised? It's got David Fritz's name on it, man. That dude's a oh, I know, fool. I know. All right, I'm no, just but like, what, what, what? Top, top three colors. If you, if you could only fish three Fritz sides for a variety of watercolor conditions in the big one, what colors yep. are you buying? Okay, hold on. I got to pull them up because I, I can tell you the colors. That's, I don't know the names. A, okay, I understand. It's all right. It's all right. It's uh, all right. Hey, and by the way, here. somebody somebody mentioned suspend strips. I'll give you a little tip. They don't stick as well as lead golf tape go to the sport lead news store go, go go to the golf section get yourself lead golf tape that stuff won't come off suspense strips you got super glue you gotta like push on it hard the whole <laughs> yeah. thing falls off it just pisses me off man so, yeah so um, agreed but my, and if you can't get your crankbait to suspend you can put a little lead on the on the on and this is where i generally will put my lead it, each bait's different but it's a shad wrap but you know if you ain't if you ain't throw weight in the shad wrap you just ain't living you ain't living, man. Come on. Just ain't living. <laughs> so, Come on, man. About honey seven shad. Come on. It's going to be honey shad. Uh huh. Special red crawl. Oh, because yeah. I got to have a crawl bait in there. You know you got to have a red crawl. And then one that's been super sneaky for me is HD green crawl. It is a matte, hyper realistic crawl pattern, like almost like a, like a bait wrap with a solid black back. That matte color, cloudy days. Man, it, mm. it glows. It glows. It glows Ooh. green. And a lot of the lakes mm. around me, green is a very prominent color. Highland Reservoirs, okay. I don't know if it's the crawdads or the bait fish or what it is. Green plays. And so those are the three that's been killing it. Have you ever put out a crawfish trap? I always wanted to do this. I pitched this idea as, as a show to Travis. Put out some crawfish traps. Bring my, my mobile jig making skirt with a bunch of skirt material. Match the hatch on the jigs and go out and fish a jig. I've not done it. Know crawl. You got to. I've not done it, but I've thought I've got the crawfish trap. Will you do it the, this year? Oh, hell yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, because I right, did I'll... it with a Ned rig one time. We did a video. I'll have to yeah. find the video. I can send it to you. We yeah. were kayak fishing. We pulled up on this little shoal, and I go to flip yeah. rock. And they're oh, like, nice. They're like, Rudd, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to find crawdads. And they're like, okay. So I'm flipping rocks, flipping rocks. And what was crazy is within like a 20 yard stretch, I pull out four different crawdads that were four completely different colors. What well, oh my god, from what to what? Black. I had one that was solid black. I had you one had that was brown. Yes, brown with red. I had one that was green and red, and I had another one that was like a like a almost like a rusty, like the rusty crayfish looking one. You have but you have a picture of that black one that's on your Instagram way back, isn't it? Oh man, yes, I, I think it's on there. But here's that's the deal, Eric. Cool. Is down here, man, like in the Tennessee river systems, all these tributaries, there are like hundreds and hundreds of species sure. of crawdads. And so like you can go from Creek to Creek to Creek and get a different yeah. color of crawdads. And I've even noticed yeah. going from one side of the lake to the other, 
and putting fish in the whale, they'll spit up one color crawdads on one side of the lake and another color crawdads <laughs> on the other side of the lake. So you better be throwing the jig that's this color on the other side of the lake. That, 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 that <laughs> bass will go, man, that's a crawl from the, over there. I'm not even. Yeah, crazy. I mean, you know, I don't know. Crazy. I don't know if they can do it, but it, it, but I've seen it happen. It's crazy. Well, here's the thing then. So here's the lesson. It yeah. doesn't matter what color jig you throw. Just throw a jig. God dang it. That's, that's right. It makes you <laughs> look like a crawdad. A jig. <laughs> well, dude, I think just, crawdads just are the jig. most. I think crawdads are the most overlooked, oh. like form of food for a fish, especially a bass. Like I think that so many people overlook crawdads so much. Very true. Very true. All right, I got a question for you. What is your favorite? I think I found my favorite finesse jig that I never heard about. Okay. Hit ball ball head jig. I'm gonna hold it up and let's see how let's see the the in, is it the, re readily the, available? Maybe. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, they <laughs> sell it, but if it ain't sold out when you go to look for it. So of the 123 <laughs> people watching right now, who can identify this jig? I'm gonna show you the hook because that's the key element of it and the bait keeper. Hold on, I have a special uh -huh. feature that, on the screen that, that I might come to. It is. It oh is, my it word! Is. I love this. Look at I this man. This. <laughs> All right, here it is, man. This is the. This is uh. Hella bass ripped me off. He's now calling his the bait cam. He's got two cameras, but there it is. There's the hook. <laughs> See, it is O'Shaughnessy style. I love it. Jack Hennessy right I, there. I'm gonna. I'm gonna show you the bait keeper. Can you see it? It's a double one, right? See the okay. bait keeper. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then now you get the ball head. It is a cross eye, right? And a very mm -hmm. thin weed guard with a very sparsely tied skirt so let's see uh has anybody said it yet negatory negatory it is okay i'll give you a clue i'll give you a clue so there is a partner in this business uh who didn't originate the jig but he's now involved in the business and he is the son of a legendary ozark angler Randy Blockett. No. And this, and this oh, jig my. is this, 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 jig, this, jig, this jig is not ten dollars. This jig is not it's not apex. Oh, apex is close. Nickel Nicholas Estes got it. It's the Dirks jig. The it's Dirks the Dirks jig. jig. In my Dirks. opinion, now these are all half ounce. And Ben, I don't know if they bite this uh, but um <laughs> no, probably not. Let's not show it anymore. Uh, oh, then I won't. Well no, I'm, I, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Would a smallmouth bite that color? Maybe. Oh, for I sure. Mean, dog stomp so, it is small what it mouth, is. Smallmouth are so, so curious, man. <laughs> I think that. you can throw anything, right? Like, it that. can be the most obnoxious thing, but if you can make them curious, and no, then get the incite curiosity. reason. Yeah, exactly. And then incite reason for them to bite it. I got some little ditties I've been working on, man. I got some stuff that I've been working on in the Bass Lab, man. <laughs> I can't wait to bring it to a smallmouth fish wreck. I can hardly contain myself, man. I had to get That's the components so cool. from Russia, Alex. No, I am Russia. not handy. I'm not handy like a Southern man. I'm a Yankee, and that's all there Russia. is to it. I, Mother I did. Russia. I, I bought it from. <laughs> I'm going to hear Aaron calling. Hey, uh, they, <laughs> Mother look, Russia. Man. Listen, comrade. Dolce Doña. But anyway, man, I, I, I'm pretty. Oh, I'm God. Pretty, he's learned Russian. Oh. I, ha I had to to order it, but I just I'll leave you with this. Hold on, man. OK, so look, this is just a regular trick worm. Right. And but yeah. look, look, it's not it's not a swivel. It's not one of those big old. Uh, what do you call those oh, things? So, it's not a big old. It's not a big old. It's not a big yes. old pivot head. Yeah, this is a yeah. ch ch Chabruska. Oh, dude. Chabruska. I Chabruska, so, and I I tied that material on my favorite cover shot hook. Now it's it's the owner cover shot. So I got a little skirt material. So this is kind of like the evolution of my shaky jig worm. I'm trying to like find a way to do it in in volume because I've I've had a lot of success. But nonetheless, anyway, I'm pretty excited. So why has why haven't any companies around here brought that yet? Right? Because you see, I it don't know. I don't all know. over online, right? Like you look at right. AliExpress, you look at you know yes, all these yes yes places. You find those stupid little ball head looking swivel heads. Yeah, they make them in tugs in. They make yeah. them in color. They make them in this flavor so you can come through grass. It's like a little pointy head. I mean, it's a funky purple, but whatever. You know, they, they yeah. have them in black too. But uh, See, I watch um, a guy who is from Sweden. 
or Italy, Sweden. No, the ones from Sweden, ones from Italy. And he perch yeah. fishes all the time, and he uses that's, those things. But that's drags them around. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a perch thing. It's a perch. Yeah. Thing. Make no mistake about it. Chabruska, I think, probably means like perch or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I might even be saying it wrong. Perch. So yeah. they're catching perch, yeah. but I, I'll like probably biggest. end up catching. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, like the they yeah. call them tench, tench. Yeah. And they're like that tall and like yeah, that long. Yeah, they're huge, these are man. yeah, they're big fish. So I I don't know, man. I like the concept of a free swinging. It's not a shaky head that's attached. It's got that yeah. freedom of movement. I can't even imagine what a what a high float plastic would. I mean, put a little mango magic on that thing, Ben. For Hello. real. For real. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny we that's could do funny. a collab little mango magic and bass <laughs> lab come on man we won't be stopped catching them i keep oh, shaking this crankbait i keep shaking this crankbait because it's an old norman but it's it's the old material and so when yeah. i think about like okay let's talk so this is about hard baits and this is about crankbaits in in particular and this is about materials that companies choose to use to make their bodies of the crankbait, right? So when I think about a fish that a bass eats, a bluegill, a shad, or whatever it is, a blueback herring, they are not made of plastic, right? So mm -hmm. a fish, you know, he's feeding on, based on the biologist you talked to, scent. So he could smell that blueback herring and he's the highest protein value shake for the fish that day that's why they chase them offshore so crazy in blueback lakes but is there a sound that a fish and is the resonance of a balsa wood plug that 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 acoustic sound that that fish has swimming through the water that balsa imitates better than plastic so if you're if you're if you're hitting the shape profile and action does the wood bait fool them better than the plastic bait, better than the, this is butyrate, by the way. And this is a soft plastic that old school baits were made of. You had to glue it together. You can't sonic weld it. I don't know if anybody knows how they put two halves of mm -hmm. Chinese plastic baits together, but they yep. do. And then they go like 10,000 times it's vibrant. You can't even tell, but then it's welded yeah. together through the vibration. These had to be glued together. And I think, Correct me if I'm wrong. Is Norman still making? Yeah, they put out a bait, the speed end, which is butyrate. So they're taking the time to glue two halves together still mm -hmm. with butyrate. But it's soft. And this old lead thump, can you hear that? Mm -hmm. I tell you, man, yeah. some of the older butyrate plugs have just like the old screw tail bombers. Man, I wish they still made butyrate plugs. But is there something to it? Am I just imagining it? Well, Don't I'll care. tell you this much. There's dudes who are tying braid instead of split rings on balsa crankbaits around here. Ott what? Defoe let the secret out on a video about what? it, but to make it even more silent than it is. Holy so, crap. Can you imagine? I, I saw Seth Frider do that on a, on a blade bait. And I'm just like, man, yeah. I don't have the patience to change the split rings out. I, how am I going to yeah. tie braid? <laughs> Yeah, I know, 59. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do crazy stuff in the winter, but that's just one thing I won't do. Some of these does it, company, like, dude, that's miserable. <laughs> why don't they start a company where, like, could you how are you gonna get it on the bait then? That don't make any sense. You got to do it at home, gotta be yeah. a southern man. Uh, so, dude, I mean, it's just something that like it's just that extra step. Like, literally, what's crazy is you take a boss of crankbait and you go. And then you change out to split rings to braid yeah. it goes. And uh, there's nothing. nothing. It's just that next step. Like it's that next step of silence. Isn't that crazy? And, and dude, I don't know. That doesn't really answer the question that you asked, but I'll just tell you that that's something weird I've seen. And so like, there's obviously something wow. to the, the hydrosonic or the, or the, the, the sonic signature that's putting out. Right. You know what I mean? I don't know what it is. I think a lot of the times it's contrast. It contrasts mm. the environment around the fish and sure. it allows them to, to pinpoint where it's at. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think that's a lot of the times what it is. And I think, you know, you do extreme things in clear water to make bait silent and more subtle. True. And you do extreme sure. things in dirty water to make things more loud, loud. and more sure. obnoxious. And I sure. think then there's like a weird in-between of finding that in-between in mixing water or whatever you're looking for. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. Interesting. Would you ask the Berkeley scientist, if I'm ever invited back, 
and I'll behave myself tonight and come back to, and I'll drink <laughs> bourbon next time, even though I don't drink, but I will. Can you imagine That's me drinking I, bourbon and yeah, getting on this show? No. I mean, I'm drinking coffee <laughs> and you can't get to bourbon. It would be over, but I'll, I'll join you. <laughs> anyway, uh, so ask those Berkeley scientists, have they done a study on what bass can pick up best and maybe respond best to with their lateral lines, right? I have. Yeah. Okay. I need to know the frequency. Is it the one knock lead? Is it the high pitch BB? Like, why does a shad make a sound of like a rattle trap with 25 BBs in it or whatever the number they put in it, right? You've heard them. You yeah. see the school yeah. of shad and they're going. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I, I think mean, what? That question, <laughs> I think that question plays beautifully into the question Sobe asked earlier. And I'll think it, okay. it plays beautifully into a comment that I saw. So Sobe asked, do you believe that there's certain times a year that, I forgot how he worded the question, but he said, do you believe certain times a year the fish, you know, um, what was the, I would love to read the question verbatim because I don't want to jack it up. All right. So if you're here, man, ask, ask your question again, exactly the way you asked it 20 minutes ago. It hits up here somewhere. I, uh, right. right. uh, Nope, 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 nope. Uh, But we'll find it here in a minute, but pretty much he was asking, do you think that the, like the bass different times a year are going to be more willing to eat or something like that. And then someone else said, you know, how many fish has Keith Combs caught on a six XD on Lake Fork? Well, do you think time of year dramatically affects bass's intelligence? Absolutely. Mm. I think it does. Sure. Because I think if you have summer schooling bass and you've got a bunch of bass that are congregated in an area together, instinctually, they're going to have a competitive instinct. They're going to compete with each other. And so if you can trick one of those bass to eat a 6XD, then you can trick 20 bass to eat a 6XD because they become competitive with each other uh, because of the time of year and, and how they're formed together because of the time of year. Whereas just like in the winter, when you have these big individual bass that aren't here in East Tennessee anyway, like you have those bass that go offshore and you can go do the drop and you can drop on them. And if you can get one of those fish to eat, you can get 20 of them to eat. But what I like to do is go cranking wow. and pick off those individual bass. And for those bass, it's the same thing. I have to be a lot more subtle. I have to be a lot more finesse. I have to be yeah. do those extra steps to be more subtle to get those fish to eat and to trick them. And so yeah. I think absolutely, depending on the time of the year and depending on the stimulus that's in you know being input upon them, yeah, it's going to affect how a bass. I don't think their intelligence, but how they instinctually react to things. Yeah, and so it's just like a deer. What's the best time of year to kill a deer when they're trying to get some? Big bucks make stupid decisions when they're trying to make babies. <laughs> yeah. Bass make stupid decisions when they're around other bass. Yesterday, great example. I caught a smallmouth. Another smallmouth follows him up, trying to eat the bait out of his mouth. My buddy drops his Ned rig down there. We double up. Mm. that's a perfect situation where a bass instinctually made a stupid decision and put himself in a dangerous situation to be caught because he was competing with another fish. Right on. That's and right. I think that, I don't think that there's any amount of, 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 you know, genetics or anything, anything that can be passed down in certain scenarios that the instinctual drive to kill and to eat will override everything. And All then right, I think a- sometimes the Go instinctual ahead. drive to self-preservation will override everything. Mm. I think it just depends on the fish that you're dealing with. Because again, like I said earlier, eat, make babies, and don't get killed. And so there's two, two-thirds of that, that equation there in the bass. And when those two-thirds start pulling at each other, in certain, in, and I don't know what it is, in some bass, self-preservation is going to win. In some bass, kill and eat is going to win. And it, I think it just depends on the fish. That's that's my experience with looking at fishing, experiencing fish, and being around fish is one or two is going to win. It's just dependent right. on a bunch of different existential factors that we probably can't control. I mean, hell, the way the moon's tilted, the way the earth's tilted, the way the sun's <laughs> shining. I mean, like, it's a bunch of big shit that we can't control. But Very all that true. big shit comes down into this little this little bass, and it makes it make a decision. Trying to I, put it all together, man. I yeah. wonder, like with your your um, your your big and Fritz side, you know, your cover cranking, you figure it out by helping suspend the bait is getting you more bites to upsizing your trebles, right? Mm-hmm. You, you say it has that secondary action, which is mm-hmm. helping probably trigger bites. 
But are there a few? Let's say you actually took the time to take the split rings off and put the 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 loop knots on with the braid, and then Berkeley figured out a way to put like a little fur coat on that Craig, <laughs> and then you could put like <laughs> you could put Matt Max scent on it, just a yeah, little yeah, something, yeah. something. And so there it sits, and it's got this Max scent because Max scent for small mouth, it's there's got to be something going on. Like I was talking about this maybe with Ben the other night on Jig Squad, like yeah. I threw a Berkeley flatworm on, on the back of Travis's open water jig because he stopped throwing the jig and went back to his Ned because that's what he likes to do is throw the Ned and look at the fish on the mm -hmm. live scope. And I'm just casting, feeling the grass patches where the bigger fish were, and I'm snapping the jig out of grass. But I had the flatworm on. And I'm thinking to myself, because I went on a little tear, and I know he's looking at fish. I can't see nothing. I'm in the back of the boat. I'm just rando casting. Is the max scent worm going to the bottom and going like sending out this aquasonic sound? It's going <laughs> kick, 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 kick. Like, so, like no, it, it has to be. I'll tell you a story about max scent, and it blew my mind. I'm at a high mountain reservoir, Western Maryland, Deep Creek Lake. I got a place up there. It's got a lot of small, small mouth. We're fishing a Wednesday night tournament. We got beat to the dock system where my buddy knew we could win. The dude was fishing a Zebco 33 with a trick worm. A Zebco 30, 303, maybe, or a 33. Anyway, the close face one. Yeah. Like you used to fish mm -hmm. when you were a kid and beat everybody's yeah. ass with 15 pounds and change. So we said, we're out of here with zero on our little dock line. <laughs> we're going up to the dam and try to catch like nine pounds of smallmouth for five fish, by the way. So we're on a buddy's boat, his boat, that this guy fishes the NPFL. He had some flatworms in the boat, the right color, green pumpkin go. Justin goes, I can't take anymore. We're breaking open Timmy's pack of flatworms. He had like three. And he had a tournament the next week. He just goes, I don't care. So Justin put one on. I'm still fishing my favorite drop shot worm for smallmouth. And I haven't had a bite. He cast out and catches one. and catches another one. And maybe he caught another one. I don't remember. And I said, give me one of them flatworms. I got to have it. Now he's looking at the mega live. I'm not looking at anything. I just cast out and catch a fish. Then I catch another one. Two casts. Five casts, five fish. That's ridiculous. It I was casting. What Dude, is going on with that bait? Here's what's crazy. So here's, here's you what's tell crazy. me, Alex. What's going on? I know I didn't cast on a head of a smallmouth. Dude, so here's <laughs> the wild crap. On. I want to know. Maxent, Maxent. So I've yeah. caught a lot of largemouth on Maxent. I've caught largemouth on Maxent. Okay, me too. I've been throwing that little trooper a lot on a net head. Been throwing a little okay. troopers, a little net rig bait. So yesterday yeah. I crank up a bait. I catch two largemouth on a crank bait. I turn around. Yeah. I pick up that damn little trooper. And I start catching spots in smallmouth. And then I that go to another work. bank and only catch smallmouth. I know there's largemouth there. And I did this on another lake. I catch five smallmouth on max scent. And the one largemouth that I missed, I reel my, my max scent little trooper up to the side of the boat. And he falls it all the way to the side of the boat and doesn't eat it. And so, like, what is it about a smallmouth in particular with max scent? Like, dude, and I'm talking... In its spots and smallmouth in particular. Now, largemouth eat it. I've caught plenty of fish on on a on a general max scent largemouth. I mean, I've done that. But dude, sure. the smallmouth. It's so like, the, the smallmouth must be so much more tuned into scent than largemouth. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question for the Berkeley scientists. Like, have they studied smallmouth versus largemouth? Do they, Do they have a bigger olfactory rather? system or something? Exactly. Are they more tuned or are they just more yeah. aggressive? I don't know, but you're right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you That's know, you got to think amazing. a salmon can a salmon, salmon, salmon. Yeah. Um, I'm a redneck, so it's salmon. Um, a salmon can <laughs> a salmon is born in a creek. It swims yep. out into the ocean a thousand miles. And by the light of the moon in the scent, it can track its way back to the creek that it was born in down to the at the inch where it was born. That's and nuts. like they've I mean, they've there's I watched a whole two hour documentary about it. Everybody else would have probably thought it's the most boring documentary on planet Earth. Man, I was glued to the freaking screen, okay? Wow. And, and, like, I was thinking, man, if a bass even has one-thirtieth of that ability, then he has more ability to smell than you could ever imagine. Yeah. And in, like, some conversations I've had is they're putting scent in the water, and bass are, like, as soon as the scent hits the water, bass are going, Bruh! And like, what is that? Like, and <laughs> sharks do that. I mean, yeah. a drop of blood in the water, you know, with a mm -hmm. shark or whatever. They can smell. I mean, like, you know, you can bring in fish with chum lines from miles away. 
So right. you can't tell me as soon as that bait hits the water and as soon as that technology, I don't know how it works, starts putting sure. shit out into the water, that them that every living creature, because I've caught bluegill, crappie, saugers, sure. everything sure. on max scent. Like not everything in the in the water is like, what in the hell is You're, that? Right, like, right. I gotta right. go, I gotta go figure that out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think so much of it has to do with scent i think scent plays so much bigger of a role in bass particularly and in really all fish than i think we could ever imagine a really so how, do, how do we apply it to that do we need it especially in winter fishing like slowing it down you know the pull worm retrieve you know you're grinding the bait on the bottom you're fishing you know a rocky bank and it's going from chunk to pea gravel and you're just you know you're hitting that transition you know fish is there and you're stopping it and if that scent was going He's got to eat it at mm -hmm. that point, maybe. Yeah. I think I that's the know. biggest thing about max scent, right? Is its actual scent dispersion and ability to hold scent. So your Versus... crankbait would start out this big, and it would go to like this big at the end. You have to <laughs> yeah. change crankbait. It's like a, <laughs> well, like yeah. a candy. It's a it's like a piece of meat. Max scent, like sitting on the on the deck of your boat or something, like a used pile of max scent, it'll look way different after like a day or two of sitting on the deck of your boat yeah. than it originally did because like – it dries out or the set. I don't know why. I don't know the science behind it, but it like gets nasty and soft and like just junk. Could they yeah. get a little Maxent niblet to put like on the on the <laughs> shank of the the hook, just like on the shank right here? I just want a little Maxent niblet that would interfere with anything, you know? I don't know. And man. see, I wonder. I I wonder truthfully, you know, obviously with a hard bait, it's almost all reaction. Sure. Like you're you're in hitting an instinctual yeah, driving a fish to kill, but like you say, when you're slowing down, that's can what I mean. that extra little just umph of that scent be enough yeah. to drive that bass? Well, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. this. This is this is what has shown me more than anything is live bait fishing. Live mm. bait fishing shows you how many fish live in an area and how many fish you truly fish right past and you never get to buy. This is mm. a crazy conversation. And so, man, so I went, I've gone live bait fishing. I've done it three times now. Yep. And I do it once or twice a year because it's just a shit ton of fun and you always catch giant fish. So there was one day that I went with, it was me, Caleb, and Bailey from the Serious Anglers podcast. Caleb threw artificial baits all day long. Bailey yep. switched between artificial and live bait. I caught over 25 fish. My best five went 40 pounds. Caleb never got a bite. That's and so Bailey, crazy. the entire time that he threw artificial baits, never got a bite. That's nuts. And like you could go back through that area. I could drop you down there, Eric, with every tool that you wanted in your arsenal, and you might catch a limit. If That's I go back crazy. down through there with a bucket full of gizzard, gizzard shad, I'm going to catch 40 pounds. That's crazy. And so to kind of add on to that as well, you know, you look at like shock reports and they'll go and shock an area. Yeah. I've been behind a shock boat before. And like I've seen studies done where they tell guys, hey, we're going to give you an hour to fish the shit out of this pocket. And guys go fish that pocket for an hour and catch one three pounder. And then the shock boat goes through there and shocks up 250 fish. Yeah, that, true. True story. On the upper bay, my buddy Jack Rinkers fished his favorite dock system. He caught nothing. The shock boat came behind and shocked up like 175 fish. Yep. He and so, got zero bites. Yep. And so I think every added what? advantage that we can have. And what? I think scent. I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. I think every added advantage that you can have to get a bass to bite is there i think you, you would be sick at your stomach at the end of the day if you could put a little camera on your bait and see how many oh, fish yeah. follow it but don't dude. ever eat it oh my i mean God. Oh. dude like like yeah. it's crazy yeah like like mouth it and spit it out oh yeah oh yeah like how many bites do you not feel hey. yeah oh hold on I, oh wait, wait what was that <laughs> yeah yep crazy man that would be something something yeah i'm have you thrown the the uh the jig with the max i mean the uh power bait yeah. skirt and yeah. well, yeah. it's, it it's good I, i'm not 100 percent. they smell they smell really bad yeah. <laughs> they smell like they smell like you fillet a fish is the best way i can describe it <laughs> like like you take like a nasty like a carp 
and lay that Ooh. bad boy open and get you a good whiff of it, that's exactly what it smells like. They smell oh. terrible. Oh, yeah. and I'm just not sure. Like, I think it's just like Alex said, it's another added potential benefit. Yeah, more than anything. It's just it's just tricking them, man. It's tricking them. I mean, that's True. all you're doing. Every time you get a fish to eat an artificial bait, it's tricking them. I think what live bait fishing is, it's not tricking them. I mean, it's giving them what they want. It's giving them the real thing. You don't have to trick them because it's the real deal. (laughs) Whereas with anything artificial, I mean, dude, look at an Alabama rig. Like how freaking unnatural is an Alabama rig? But all you're doing is you're giving them enough flash and enough movement and enough shake and enough shimmy that it's like overwhelming to a bass almost. It's like, oh my God, I got to try to kill it. You know what I mean? And you just trick them. But how many fish follow that thing in that you never see? How many fish do you swim that thing right by and they never even move? Like it doesn't even tickle their fans. Like we're only, I think we're only seeing really like if you go fish for eight hours, I think that and you catch, let's say you catch 15 fish. I think that you've seen one one thousandth of the actual potential potential of what you could have caught during that day. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's a now it's everybody's, mind-mending. everybody's over in the comments trying to figure out how we can chum for fish. I'm gonna come <laughs> up with like a damn like a spray we can spray in the water. <laughs> I love like I love pro here. I put it on a bunch of soft plastic baits, mm. but I, this is what keeps bringing me back to Maxent and actually being like the material and the dispersion ability mm. is like Procure is great when it's on the bait, but mm. like the problem is it doesn't stay on forever. Does it, does it soak in? Like my buddy swore that like Jack's juice like <laughs> soaked into the bait if you like sprayed it overnight or whatever. You know, I like know can you was... marinate? Can you marinate regular plastics and have it absorb into? uh plastics like if you think, put it in like the guy the guy who's the taco Itu that like marinated his baits and they swelled right. up and they look what the hell did they look like they well, were i ugly. think isn't plastisol just by nature hydrophobic man go ahead alex with the uh, science brain tonight i don't know <laughs> I, mean, I think that um those baits uh, what the eco aqua gear shrimp or eco aqua shrimp that, that's a um, different material it's it's not plastic Oh, so he was fishing. He was fishing eco, eco. He was fishing eco bait. Oh, got it, got it. So it absorbed. Yeah, Um, but no, I think it's interesting. So Nick Rose, who messages in all the time, he's one of my buddies. He, um, I think, learned this on Travis's podcast. Takes his soft plastic baits, soaks the scent, soaks the salt out of his plastic baits, and then is trying to re soak them with like the procure uh jelly or, or juice so it like sucks like into the bait right so he basically what? soaks the salt out of his baits dries them and they have all the holes and like nasty looking and then he's re-soaking them with the juice that's wild like you know, you know how like the old zero which was by the way the original ned rig you guys yeah. know that yeah, yeah. of course mm-hmm. you, of course mm-hmm. you would so anyway mm-hmm. but i mean like if you like like when I was cutting my zeros in half to make the Ned, when I first discovered that article in Midwest Finesse, I think it was mm-hmm. it, it, like, I mean, the salt would just pour out of that thing. And so that <laughs> had to be both. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, like, I mean, it just pour out of it, man. The Greg Hackney package. And uh, yeah. but I would I got put, like smelly, there. I would put yeah. some smelly jelly on it. And I know that yeah. I felt like it was going into the bait. And the more ratty it got, the better it worked. Yeah. yeah. Which is wild, too, right? See, um, I wonder. I wonder if the next step in scent technology is pheromones. Like, is ooh. Max scent? I don't know the science behind <laughs> Max scent. It's probably about the, pheromones, dude. It's I probably the most. Cologne. I bought some cologne in college that swore yeah. it was pheromone based. Right, I like it, it man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mikey dude. and I. I'm like this. Mikey came like up here. I'm and, aware uh, of that shit. We <laughs> I didn't hear any more girls. We were in the parking lot at Frank's, and this guy who owns a company called Lure Lipstick is like saw Mikey in the parking lot. He goes, oh my gosh, are you Mikey Balls? I got to sell you on this stuff called Lure Lipstick. He's like, it only contains the fear pheromone and it scares the fish into biting. And like, the whole week it was just, like, 
how do you how do you only get the fear for fear of them, especially like put them in a tank and like scare them yeah, yeah. Scare the fear <laughs> them. alex just throw, throw, throw that whopper popper over Bang yeah. it, it cringe. <laughs> got it uh, now push uh, it back into that pot we got uh, it that's Stir it, Eric. I just That's love great. it, man. I just love it. But I mean, seriously, I think, I think, you know, and I don't know how Max Scent works. That's probably like the most heavily guarded secret. I mean, it's like locked behind four vaults, you know. Like they don't patent it because if they patent it, then then the the what? formula gets out, right? I mean, it's like the Krabby Patty secret formula, dude. Yeah. But like, I just, I just wonder, I just wonder if Krabby like, Patty next... secret formula is crab, by the way. Exactly right. <laughs> um. So I just wonder if the next step in bass fishing technology is pheromones. Like, is it, it and is Max sent some kind of pheromones that they're not telling us? I mean, if they figured out how to make some kind of synthetic or even a natural pheromone that they're, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I think that's what, you know, we often talk about, me and Ben talk about, like, what's the next step in bass fishing technology? You know, we've talked about electronics. We've talked about baits. We've talked about this you know i think electronics it's making iphone level electronics that can take several updates and and you don't have to replace your hardware every year you just do software updates mm. i think the next step in bait design is synthetic plastics not only hard plastics but soft plastics and, and you know maybe some kind of organic polymers or some crap like that that we've never seen i mean 3d print and organics you know they 3d printed a heart yeah a few months ago at a hospital. That's and so crazy. like, don't tell me that it's not just a amount of time before that starts getting applied to things as simple as bass fishing. And we're making hormone infused plastics that literally like a fish can't help, but try to kill it because it's hitting its olfactory system on a hormonal level. That's just uncontrollable. Like, that's you, crazy. You know what I, I mean, that's what, that's what, you know, Dove estrus is it's a hormonal pheromonal level of interaction with a with a buck's brain that he can't Dang. help but come over there and take a sniff of it what so why hell? can't we apply that to bass fishing man yeah. dang i feel bad yeah. for the buck now the bass know, right? buck and yeah. bass that's a good rain suit by the way holy moly <laughs> man that's nuts uh-huh what it's crazy man apparently the guy with the lipstick's got it <laughs> got to the, fear, the fear hormone i had to put uh, some lip balm on for this next segment what dang yeah. the all new berkeley triple x over here triple wow. x seven. triple x triple x oh shoot okay eric Man. so we're gonna start to wind this thing down but i kind of want to yes. get a couple more questions on jdm baits sure so if someone was to go out and look for you know just like a jdm starter kit like like mm. what to get them excited about jdm baits what are like Man. three baits you would give them to check out? Well, get get yourself one of them Imakatsu Magula moth chatters. Even the perfection, Absolutely. if you can't find the Magula, um, the monster has the bigger the bigger um, hook. But you know the um, the perfection, you'll you'll be able to tell the difference between the perfection uh, and the monster. The monster has the the textured blade. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. And mm -hmm. the perfection, if I can grab one here, uh, this one has wires on it. Um, has a smooth blade perfection so the hooks are different different gauge but uh they're both great baits so you couldn't go wrong with either of those um get yourself a bladed crankbait man i mean if you can find the waddle bats you won't be sorry um that'd be a second one that i'd get and maybe let me think about something that really excites me in the jdm markets and spinner baits are coming back into play my favorite jdm spinner bait it, because i like the blade combination it's the uh super eruption by jackal uh they still make the junior i think you can find it but the original jackal super eruption which is not a junior size uh it has you know just really cool um features uh, i like the reverse teardrop on the blade it gives the thump of probably in indiana not a colorado but a lot of thump but the flash of a willow it's a reverse teardrop so That's i always cool. thought that was incredibly innovative on their part 
Uh, they've welded the blade. Um, and you could do this with spacers. So look, man, you can find a bait to do this with spacers. But I like how there's a bend in the arm and the, the secondary blade. You know, here's the lead blade by the hook. The secondary blade is welded in place by two beads. And so you when you, you know, if I'm reeling past the stump and I stop it for that split second and it's falling down, the blades automatically engage. And they start to engage instantly like as soon as that bait hits the water on a cast, if I'm not like on the retrieve, as that bait is falling, I've gotten bites like on a cast. Like I go to reel in a grass bed and the fish is already on it. Because when that blade, huh. when that bait's falling, the blades are going, they're helicoptering. So it's a That's great crazy. bait to like, you know, if you're burning the, the bait and you stop it in a grass hole, the bait, the blades right are in the grass hole, man. Down. Yeah, gotta you get got it right it, in the grass hole, son. <laughs> it's, it's a super fine cut silicone skirt. It's got a badass hook on it. Um, yeah, that'd be another one that I'd get. And the junior gets bit. I like it's a small profile bait uh, for you tidal river rats that, you know, want to downsize. It's a it's a bait that gets a lot of bites. So um, it just gets bit. That'd be, that, that would be three. That's you got a spinner bait, a chatter bait, and a crunk bait. Um, nothing really crazy. I'm trying to think, man. Oh, my God. It's have you fished, cool. have you fished the uh, scat, the cover scat? The cover scat. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, what, what, tell me more about it. Is it the one with the propeller on the back? No, it's a soft plastic. Oh, that's the noisy cat. Oh, no. soft plastic, the cover scat. Yeah. yeah, I got a whole thing from Ben at um, the hookup. Uh, the hookup, and I went through that, and there is a cover scat in that. So I got I got the cover scat. I have not thrown the cover scat, um, but I, I was plan curious. on throwing the cover scat. I mean, I could have done a little bait show on all the JDM stuff he sent me apparently there were some 300 hundred dollar jerk baits in there who knew frozen Good tequila God. what I, that's what guys were dming is, me like you could sell that on ebay right now and i'm like well, i'm not gonna do that is that those of... jerk baits that you were showing off in the yeah I'll jig show them squad? Again. oh dude you guys, you these are crazy time. jerk baits yeah we got time <laughs> let me pick the right yeah, i mean these little these little bags were i mean i just like that man that's cool that's, a, I mean, that's cool. another thing that's another thing about JDM, man, is they're so yeah. like cool about it because I think they respect the art of it so much. Yeah. It's more yeah. than oh, just for sure. it's more than just well, a it's so much plastic yeah. box. I mean, it's it's so it's so unutilitarian. Like it's like yeah. art, you know what I mean? And I think yeah, that's yeah. the difference between American design and, and other and Japanese design is we're very utilitarian and want it to work, where the Japanese yeah. want it to work and to look pretty. All right, that's my crankbait box. Sorry, I picked up the wrong one. I think it's in this one. That's okay. Sean says uh, the cover scat's legit. Unweighted okay. text rig. Yeah. Um. Here, here we go. I think I got the right box. Is this the right box? Um, it's in this mega box part. It's pretty cool. I think that's the one. Let's see. Nope. Hope I didn't take them out and put them someplace else. Do a. Uh, do you buy a lot of your JDM stuff from the hookup or do you go to like the Japan tackle shop or uh, uh, Ichiban has, was one of my favorites in the beginning uh, because I could find used baits that wouldn't break the bank. Yeah. Um, so Ichiban, which means I guess number one in, in Japanese Ichiban, Ichiban. Um, here we go. So let's see. So let's start with the one that was like getting everybody cuckoo, the frozen tequila. It's a matte finish, and this is what Ben says. It's orange belly. Uh, frozen tequila he said he would never go anywhere with small mouth without that color. That's so cool. This one is a uh, – this one is purple weenie shad. That was another one that people were going goofy on. <laughs> purple weenie. <laughs> Purple weenie shad. <laughs> Child. I love it. <laughs> what was the other one? Uh, is this one of the ones that was like everybody was going nuts? No, I don't think so. Because maybe this is the GLX natural shad. But really, I think it was the frozen tequila in the green weenie. And then what was the other one? This is the uh, this is the other bait that he said you, you he, he sent me all money. PM ill reaction. Oh, pretty. It seem too I mean, That's it's pretty. pretty. They're all pretty yeah. baits, right? You know. Yeah. You can see the color shift. The color shift, I guess, is where they've got it. You know, over maybe some of the American paint schemes. I don't know, but you know, Six Sense is doing a good job 
at, with their paint schemes too. Yeah, they have you some get, really cool paint schemes as well. They do. They do. Especially their custom them. tackle shop. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So that that's the that's the little uh that's the little show. That was the just the hard bait section. There was a whole plastic section. There was some cool stuff in there. Stuff, you know, I haven't really spent a lot of money on the more fancy JDM side of the plastics. Yes. Um just because to me, um, I don't know, man. Maybe I should have been paying attention more, right? Um, I just man, found it's the, just not as exciting, the hard bait, though. yeah. But like they have some funky keep, stuff. They you know? do, but you can keep like when you find a cool crankbait, like you yeah. can fish it over and over. You don't have right. to buy fifty packs of plastic. Right, yeah. right. I just couldn't bring yeah. myself to buy a nine dollar pack of plastics. You know, yeah. like I got you're excited, burn like. Through. Right, like yeah. before rabbit baits, you know, I'd see the hairy hog from, and I'm like, ooh, now that I would buy, right? Because yeah. it ha yeah. it was completely different, right? It was giving me some natural action that plastic might be able to do. Mixing fur and feather with plastic baits got me excited. Like, you know, that little joker got me excited for a while. So, <laughs> yeah, did I ever throw it? Nope, because I'm not really smallmouth fishing, but I threw the hairy yeah. hog, did pretty good. But, you know, you I know could what? tie my own stuff too here down in the basement, a jig with some fur and feather on it, because that's what I do in the lab. Yep. So I wouldn't spend nine ninety nine or twelve ninety nine twenty bucks shipping to get a jig that had some hair on it. You know. Yep. You know what's fascinating to me is Berkeley's whole JDM line that you can't get here. Like, that is fascinating. Like, I've asked for it too. Like, I, I like specifically asked my dude over at Berkeley. I, I like texted Nathan. I was like, "What's the likelihood of me getting some power wags?" But he's like, and he's like, and, and, and he's, he's like, he goes. He goes, I can't even get them. He's like, the pros okay. can't even get them. It's like that makes no sense. What's the story with that? That pisses me off. So you got I Berkeley, an American-made company that's selling really badass shit in Japan. Yeah. Sells to me for people would buy it for $9.99 if it costs more money to make. What the hell? Dude, yeah. so I was I was that same skate shop I was following. I need to message him to you so you can look at it. There's a yeah. guy over there that has his own signature series Abu Garcia rods. That are called the Muddy Water Series rods. They're two what? rods. One's a six ten medium heavy. The other one's like a six eight heavy or something. It's weird. They're weird. Like they're weird sizes and weird actions. Like a heavy moderate and like it's weird. I don't know what it is, but they're Abu Garcia Signature Series Muddy Water rods, Japanese exclusive, and they do Dang. the same thing in South Korea. Like the Koreans have a absolute love for Abu Garcia because it's where a lot of Abu Garcia is made. So they take pride in the fact that it's made in their country, just like we take oh, pride wow. in the fact that things are made in the U S but there's really? like whole signature series of rods, reels and baits in Japan and South Korea that are Berkeley that will, I, I don't think ever see the light of day in America. The only one that we've seen come to America is the critter hog. The critter yeah, which hog is gone, was, which is gone. They stopped. The Max and Critter Hogs, can't they get it Oh, hell, I got three packs of them. I'm holding on. To them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that Critter Hog had a little JDM inspired design. You're right, man. And then yeah. they stopped selling it. I guess it doesn't no. play. And that's the weird part. Maybe they've done their market study and Japanese inspired designs sell better over there than they would domestically, you know, because I mean, if but you're happy hard with your... baits. Have you seen the, the Berkeley Dex hard baits? Mm -mm. Baits and, and, uh, blade baits and crank yep. baits, they're unbelievably gorgeous. They're, yep. They don't like their Berkeley American hard baits are okay, they're getting way better. They're yeah, Japanese, they're improving. Yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Wow, wow. I mean, dude, maybe, you like they'll, fur. maybe they'll see the light. You like fur, they have a <laughs> they have a square bill with giant marabou tufts tied on the treble hooks. That's crazy. In the deck series of Berkeley. Like, it's just crazy crap like that, dude. Yeah, right? That's nuts, I man. I That's nuts, it. man. Yeah, I mean, I tell you what. Uh, I'd love to see some of that stuff come here, man. No mm -hmm. question about it. No question about it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a couple other little Japanese gems that, you know, I can't show. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm putting together, like, a little finesse crankbait box. I got, like, I don't know. 20 people said they were interested because I've got volumes of some stuff that I've been collecting over the years. And if I should meet an untimely uh, early death through uh, like a tragic bass fishing accident with Alex Rudd um, on the Tennessee River, 
my wife's going to haunt me. I think I told you that earlier on the show before we went live. So I'm thinning out the, uh, I always keep stock enough, but uh, yeah. So I just want to share it because I really love, that's why I stream. I like to share. A lot of people Mm -hmm. wouldn't give up what I just gave up, but I like to share some things that I know are going to get somebody some really good fish because it's probably something way different that they've ever thrown in their life. And maybe nobody on their body of water is throwing it. Um, and it's going to do something good for him. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that's what that's that's what I'm doing. Heck yeah, that's cool. damn right. Yeah, damn right. everybody. The question yeah, of brother. the evening. The question of the evening. So yes. Oh, go ahead. What's the question of the evening? Do you think JDM baits are still as valuable? Like they're still worth Ooh. paying the extra money over um, more affordable, you know, domestic made bar- market baits. Sometimes yes. I've just had too too many experiences where I've had that JDM bait fishing behind somebody who's a way better angler than me, way better crankbaiter than me, and you just can't explain it other than either A, the fish hasn't seen it before, they're not conditioned to it, it's got a crazy action that just triggered something in them that made them say, I have to bite that, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but on some levels, no, you know, I mean, I've caught as many fish on American made spinner baits that I have on the Jackal super eruption. But if somebody's throwing that hog collar in front of me, I, I, I want to feel like I've got something that's just a little bit different that if I throw it behind them and it's my job in a team turn and put a fish in the boat or two or three to, to add to the catch that day, like, you know, I love a Rico. I love a Pop R. I love them for different reasons, right? In different situations. An old yep. P70, depending upon, or just a regular size Rico or the big Rio Rico. A ton of fish on those baits. But I also like Flash and I like a prop bait. And there's a little Japanese inspired JDM popper that's got all three of those things going for it. It's got a prop. Mm-hmm. It's got a, a Flash on the bottom blade. And then it's got a cupped mouth as a popper and I can walk it and it just is providing a couple more visual cues and sound that I can't find in any popper made domestically or any other JDM popper. And it's, it got, it's just been, it just got bid for me. Like, like it, it factored into my championship at the Bojangles, which is my biggest team tournament whenever, you know, got us to help us get the points championship and the two day classic win on, uh, on Gaston. My buddy I think, yeah, I think, I think that speaks to the fact that I think for some people going out and buying JDM baits would be a waste of money because they don't spend the time on the water enough right? to, I, I don't want to say appreciate because I think everybody appreciates it when they buy it. You know what I mean? Right. Like you wouldn't buy some of this stuff at the prices that we buy it to not appreciate sure. it. Sure. But I think that for so, like for your common, you know, bank angler who's yeah. getting to fish, you know, one time a week, I don't think a $35 chatterbait in some instances, God, <laughs> because I know I've spent ridiculous amounts of money on them is, is worth right. it to them over like the Z man. But I think when you get into, oh, I, the, I, I agree. I yeah, agree. when you get into the level of angling and just the dedication that we have to the sport, then yes, it's worth it because yep. we've spent enough time on the water to not only appreciate it, but to yep. also be able to dissect and pick up on the nuances of a certain bait more quickly and then apply that tool the way it should be applied. Whereas right. an angler who's a little bit lower on the rung of the angling journey Maybe sure. he doesn't need to pick that bait up until he's a few more rungs up on the angling journey. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I mean, agree. You know, it's like you don't go out and buy a, I don't know what a, what a good pair. Like you don't go out and buy a brand new set of tailor mades the first time you go to the golf course. True. You know what That's I mean? That's right. That's you, right. You go buy you go buy a cheap set to make sure you like it. And so, like, yeah. I think it's one thing. Like, I have kids ask me all the time, like, if you could buy four JDM baits, what would you buy? I'm like, I wouldn't. I would take that money and I would go buy. 10 things that you can get at the tackle store for the same amount of money. And then you have 10 baits right. instead of four. You know what I mean? M- Master a Z-Man six, nine, find it on sale at Dick's and go get a Z-Man chatterbait and then experiment yeah. with a bunch of American made trailers 
and watch yep. how the bait operates right in front of your eyeballs, yep. right? Yep. Uh, yep. Learn how to snap it through grass. Focus on yep. your rod, reel, gear, line, right? Yep. Catch a few fish, develop a confidence yep. in it, and then expand yep. your chatter bait line. I would start, I would never send anybody out at that level and go buy JDM uh, because there's a, you know, I mean, angler asset spinner baits, one of the best out there. Uh, you can get it for, you know, a reasonable price and it's going to catch them just like my little JDM spinner bait. Um, yep. You know, it. I feel like it just gives me that edge that I need yep. when I'm on the back of the boat and I've got to add to the angler. I don't fish tournaments where I'm, you know, in a BFL. I only fish team tournaments. And so my mm -hmm. whole mindset is, can I bring something different to the table that's going to produce an extra bite or two during that day that's going to make me a contributor to the game? Because I'm mm -hmm. getting second, unless I'm fishing a grass bed, if we're flipping or pitching to extra, like, usual cover, mm -hmm. I got to present something different. Because when I'm a scooter mm -hmm. on his water, I mean, we're fishing Cypress. He knows where the knuckle is, where the five pounder lives. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't flipping behind him and catching that bass, but there's sometimes where I've, where I've put something behind him that's very yeah. different than what he throw that does. I am either downsizing, finesse fishing, giving him a heart attack with a fairy wand, right? Yep. And that's producing a bite. Um, yep. He would never do it, but I would. And I'm risking yep. the biscuit to try to get the bite. So, and that's just yep. regular old Z Man Ned Rig, bud. And that's the old regular Z Man head and nothing from Japan in that mix with a yep. little bit of freaking. Uh, you know, uh, get yourself a little uh, uh, smelly jelly bass UV craw. Make sure it's yeah. UV because I believe in UV a little bit. I, even if they can't see UV, they can see the glitter. <laughs> and, and, you know, <laughs> I like my purple and gold. Come on. Um, so Come get on. yourself Come some of that, it. man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and if I got something stinky on my hand, it smells worse in my hand or they like it better. So, yeah, uh, that's what I would tell people to do. Hell, if you, think, even if you were a serious angler, go do that. Yeah, <laughs> if you ain't throwing yeah. a net, man. You're a fool. Yeah, I think for me, like the biggest thing is is pay the money for the innovation, not necessarily for a bait that is fairly standard, right? Like if you're looking for a bait that has something different, like a waddle bat or like yeah. you know the special JDM stuff, like really cool JDM yeah. stuff where they really put yeah. the innovation and thought behind it. Yeah, I think that's yeah. what makes baits like. Um, duo so cool and imakatsu so mm -hmm. cool and, and and that's why mega bass was so cool when they brought the vision here until everyone decided they want to knock it off everywhere sure. right but like sure. now that innovation is in your ten dollar jerk bait so like start yeah, to spend crazy, the money right yeah start to spend that money on the innovation more so than necessarily just to have a jdm bait for example that's right yes. that's right yeah good good, good point 100 percent. 100 percent. absolutely Anyways, Anyways, boys, we're going to wind this thing down. I appreciate yeah, you both man, hopping awesome. on here. Um, man, this was a really fun me. conversation. So I thank you guys it. for hopping on and talking about this with us. But uh, everyone over in the comments, we got up to like 175 viewers at one time. Um, wow. Really, really appreciate it. Tons and tons of people watching on a Sunday night when, when football is going on. So thanks That's for That's pretty incredible, to right? Chat. Yeah. yeah, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, Again, this is going to be on podcast form. If you guys are listening on podcast, we also do this live on YouTube. It's about every other week on uh, Sunday night at 8 p.m. So come check it out on YouTube at Benjamin Noak Fishing. As always, thank you guys for watching. Take care of tight lines. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye.